everyone, and welcome to Can I Just Say? I'm Elizabeth Stevens. And I'm Daphne Olive, and we are talking this week about season eight of Game of Thrones with our wonderful guests. We have Christine Kippens, who was with me to talk about season seven. Hi, you guys. Thanks for having me back. And Petra Halber, who is here for the first time. Welcome, Petra. Hi, thanks. Happy to be here. So I thought we would start, um, I guess Christine and I already did this in the last episode, and y'all should go listen to the last episodes. You can hear our histories with Game of Thrones. But I, Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask Petra and Elizabeth. So Petra, tell us your history with Game of Thrones and also your media connections to Game of Thrones. Sure. So I got into Game of Thrones in college, and I really became one of the hardcore fans because of Theon Greyjoy. Um, He's, he's my favorite character and he's the reason I am a fan site contributing podcast participating level fangirl. Oh, and I'm a writer for Watchers on the Wall. Sorry. I normally that goes without saying. Uh, Yes. Watchers on the Wall uh, is really a fabulous website, which would you call it a fan site? I mean, it feels like it's like somewhere between an online publication and a fan site to me um, with like amazing essayists. Oh, it's amazing. Everyone should check it out. Uh, I'm not sure what the official nomenclature is, but it's an absolutely wonderful thing. And if you've never checked it out, you should absolutely do so. Yeah. Smart, passionate people talking about Game of Thrones. Awesome. I'll look for that. All right. Elizabeth, tell us your history with Game of Thrones. Oh, it's so convoluted. Okay, so Game of Thrones come out, came out and everybody was watching it. I did not have HBO, but somebody, you know, found it like a do. And at the time, I was like super in conservative church mode. And I was like, oh, I can't watch this show. This is really gross. I don't like how I feel when it's on. And so then I got out of that. And was like, oh, yeah, Game of Thrones is coming up on its, like, series finale. And Daphne went to Con of Thrones and was like, okay, you should really at least give it a shot. So I was like, okay, it was last January. And I just, so season seven had already gone all the way through. And I marathoned that mother in, like, what was it, a month and a half? It happened very quickly. (laughs) I watched a lot of Game of Thrones. (laughs) Like, a lot. (laughs) So, uh, yeah, I enjoyed it a lot. There were certain characters that really I loved, particularly I loved Daenerys and Jorah. They will keep me coming back every single time. But I had a lot of characters that I really loved. Um, and I'm interested to, to talk to you more, Petra, about Theon, because I initially hated Theon. It was like, who the fuck is this guy? Get out of here. And then, of course, seeing his gorgeous arc throughout the series, you're like, OK, no, never mind. You might be the heart and soul of this program, sir. Yes, I think if anyone anyone who has listened to our podcast about black sales, Fathoms Deep, might see a similarity to how Elizabeth responded to John Silver. Sure. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yes, oh, I do have a lot to terrible. talk about. I think Petra did one of my favorite analysis videos, which was about stakes in different television shows, which talked about Game of Thrones and talked about John Silver. Made me very happy. So smart. Yes. Well, somebody sent me that. Black, so we've had a black sales reference in what five minutes, Daphne? I think you're slipping. That's, just, wait. <laughs> That's no record, honey. So yes, yeah, slipping though. I'll go for that. Yeah. I'm showing restraint. Showing restraint. That's what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> yeah, they're all used to me. Um, so I wanted to then go on. So all. Four of us are going to Con of Thrones, which is in July, Um, and all four of us are going to be on panels. So I just wanted to see if everyone could quickly list your panels. Sure. I'm going to be on At Journey's End, Theon Greyjoy, to the surprise of absolutely nobody. (laughs) Sam the Slayer, Watchers on the Wall, Night's Cast, a live recording, and a symphony of ice and fire, analyzing Rami Javadi's sound. Oh my god! I hope Ooh, I can go to that wow. one. I really hope that doesn't That's conflict with gorgeous. any of mine. I really want to go to that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I put that on my schedule. I did not get to <laughs> my schedule. I have to do that. Okay, uh, Christine, which ones are you doing? So I'm going to be on the Love Westerosi style panel, which is basically a panel about sex. (laughs) I'm so stoked about that one. 
So on the flip side of that, I'm also doing the Me Too panel, which is about, you know, inappropriate sex. Um, I'm on the Love Hate Love panel, which is about controversial characters, the characters we love to hate. And I'm on a um, kind of like a sequel to last year's Queendom panel that I did with Daphne and um, Lauren Starner and Kim Renfro. We're doing a panel that's called hashtag I'm with her Westerosi women in politics. So it's going to be very a lot of fun. interesting. <laughs> so cool. Yeah. So cool. Yes. Um, so yes, I am on that panel with Christine. I'm on the at journey's end with uh, Daenerys Tar- about Daenerys Targaryen. Um, what else am I on? Oh, the game to find the next thrones, which is going to be more of a conversation about television generally. I'm going to be doing that with Lauren and our friend Michelle, who are both television journalists. So we're going to talk about, I don't know, I'm not really in charge of that one. Michelle is, but I'm like happy to come and talk about the future of television. (laughs) Yeah, where TV goes from here, I guess. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Um, Yeah, it did change the game. Yeah. And the one I'm most excited about, I mean, other than the I'm with her, but the one I'm, that I didn't know I was going to be on that, I was most ex- that I'm most excited about is uh, one about the, it's called The Common People in the High Lord's Game, which is about people who are not nobles, but, but kind of hanging out with nobles and being, sure. so, you know, basically that's just the Varus panel as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> which, which is, is awesome. Which is what I'm going to make it, at least from my, from my seat, that's what it's going to be. What about the poor people of King's Landing? I hope they get some representation I during I don't think panel. that's the point of that panel. I mean, they should have representation at the con. I think the point of the panel is like people who are not noble, who actually were like part of the political structure, who are like the right hand people of. So it's like Davos. It's like there's just, you know, there's like Melisandre. Right. Melisandre. Yeah, of- right. So, yeah, there's so I haven't gotten in touch with those people yet, but and I absolutely want to talk about more than Varys. I just really want to talk about Varys. <laughs> Always. Yeah. Um, okay, Elizabeth, what are you doing? Uh, I am joining Petra for the At Journey's End with Theon Greyjoy, and then just attending a lot of things. I can't wait to hear all these things that you ladies are on. That's so exciting. There's so many good panels happening. So many. I was really excited about that, just to read through all of the titles even. You can tell that there's been a lot of thought put into the kind of things that they want to talk about. It's a neat con. Okay. Well, enough about that. Everyone should go to Con of Thrones. It's fabulous. If enough people who are Black Sales fans uh, go and tell us, Elizabeth and I were going to ma- do like some sort of, you know, drinks meetup kind of thing also oh, yeah, sometime that weekend. Definitely. Okay. So let's get on to talking about season eight. I wanted to do a little disclaimer for myself. Um, people who listen to any of our podcasts know that we, that Elizabeth and I really like to focus on, uh, not positivity at the expense of being honest, but we like to try to focus on aspects of things that we like while still being critical. Um, Mm -hmm. this season of Game of Thrones is a little challenging for me personally, because I personally mostly have a lot of criticism. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and the things that I like about the season are kind of more about the show in general. Um, although that also gets to my criticism because sometimes things about the show in general, I feel like kind of fell off a cliff this season. But I'm going to do my sure. very best to be both critical and positive as I try to be. And that's my disclaimer. If anyone else has anything to say generally, go right ahead. If not, we'll start getting into our topics. Yes, no, no. Just me, just me with the disclaimer. All right, I'm good. I I could just say, hey, I liked it, but <laughs> I think we'll get there. I I think you, Daphne. I think you and I share similar feelings about the final season, but I too am going to put on an optimistic face. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, well, I was invited to this podcast without any um, requirement of being positive, so <laughs> I can do absolutely nothing. <laughs> So this, yeah, Elizabeth, this might salt. be the time for you to say that you love this season. <laughs> Listen, don't invite, don't invite a lawyer without making her sign a contract. For... <laughs> um, I just, I don't know if I can uh, keep a promise at the start of the podcast saying that I'm going to remain 100% positive. I will say I will try my best. Oh, my, oh, my I... disclaimer is not me even remotely saying that. It's me, I think, being upfront about the 
Yeah, a bit the opposite, actually. Right? <laughs> just, this might be well, a big we'll just from a your little, usual like, program. No, well, just you know the somewhat internal struggle I'm having that I'm going to you know do my best. There's there are things that are interesting to me, but uh, yes, excuse me, everyone, if I veer towards criticism more than I than I usually do. <laughs> Well, as I was saying before we started recording, I think I really came into it so differently because I didn't start watching until season seven had already aired. So I had already seen a lot of ups and downs throughout the seasons as it kind of lost its footing and then found itself again. So I didn't have such high expectations going into season eight. I also didn't start watching season eight until after a lot of outrage was already happening. So my expectations were very low. But there was a lot that I found to enjoy and nothing that outraged me. Certainly, I'm not going to go so far as to say that I loved it, but I felt that it tracked. Right. There were things that I enjoyed. So in, in fact, we'll get to this at the very end. But yeah, my very favorite episode of all of Game of Thrones was in season eight. Wow. That's fun for you. <laughs> Fun for me. <laughs> Thanks, Daphne. No, I... It's like the oh, sweetie. Uh-huh. <laughs> Listen, no, no, I'm not saying say that. that. I'm not saying that to belittle your opinions. I'm, I, I'm legitimately kind of envious of people who really enjoyed this season. I really am. There's your... That makes sense. Um, you know, we've, we've each of us, I mean, Christine and I, I guess I did leave our histories uh, in the last episode and said, so we didn't need to repeat them, but, um, you know, we both are in the situation where we were there from the very beginning of the show. And it's just like, I think it might be harder for some people who did that um, because, uh, because we loved it once in a, in a much uh, less uh, complicated way. (laughs) How's that? (laughs) <laughs> a much more profound way, I would say, even just listening to Daphne and Christine, listening to the two of you talk um, from the season seven, I was amazed to find how much thought you were putting into things like the magic of Westeros versus the faith of Westeros and these things that ended up, of course, just crushing you in season eight. But for me, I was just like, wow, they're thinking really hard about these things that are like balls crazy. Just all over the <laughs> It was our mistake, though. It It was was our our mistake. mistake. (laughs) To think deeply about the show because there was there was all this time in seasons one through six in which to think deeply because the show itself was deep. But um, I think things definitely took a turn with less episodes in season seven and and season eight for sure. I mean, I don't think the first half of season seven suffered much for lack of episodes, mm-hmm. but, um, and I feel like we talked about we this did. before, but I can honestly make the same claim that Liz made only half of it. I, I didn't necessarily, um, think that this was the best season. And I'm not saying that Liz said that, but one of my, not one of my favorite episode of Game of Thrones is also in this season. There you go. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. And I it's probably going to be it's obvious. It's probably the same minutes. episode. You probably are both. <laughs> oh, you think? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I yeah. held up. You think it's You did. Uh, yeah. I, so, yeah. They were sorry. That's this is This is, this is, this okay, is we'll podcast. Get, but, yes, everyone was holding up two fingers. Um, 802 is a terrific episode. I actually – it's funny. I rewatched it today, and I was like, that is a damn good episode. And yeah. yet, I still think that we we have been so starved <laughs> Like my attitude is that we had gotten so starved for truly great episodes of Game of Thrones that like it has great stuff in it, but I think that eight oh two is not as good as we think it is. It's just that Girl, our don't you take eight oh two away no, no, from I'm me. Not, I'm not I'm not gonna try to diminish think, anything you love about that episode and I think like probably every single person's favorite thing that we're gonna say at the end might be the same things and will definitely be from that episode, but but uh, no, you're no, I take that back. That's probably not true. <laughs> but well, but... Wait, I'm saying right now, I think that it's not 802 for me. I think it's 803, which is oh. everyone's least favorite that everybody hates. Oh, it's not totally my least favorite. favorite. But I don't like it. I mean, except for Theon. Uh, uh, Theon's 802 right. is what a night of a night of the seven kingdoms. A night of the seven kingdoms, which is beautiful. Mm-hmm. Don't get me wrong. I loved it too. But no, 803, which was, I don't know what it's called, but it was the Battle for Winterfell, yeah. whatever that one was. The, the long, long night. Yeah. 
worked okay. for me a hundred percent. Now, probably for a lot of personal reasons and whatever, but which is I'm just saying a hundred percent legit. I it. That is an absolutely great that's, reason. Right. Okay. But that's what I want my fiction to do. Meet me where I am, shift my perspective on something a little bit. And that's great. Yeah. I love that's it. That's great. Okay. Well, let's start on topics. Um, I actually also just listened to re listened to my and Christine's conversation. And um, I actually want to start on something that's not even remotely really on the list that I gave you all. I want to start with Christine's. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> um, I want to start with uh, Christine's prediction. I mean, we talked quite a bit about about magic. I mean, this, this kind, it is related to our topics, but magic versus politics, like the mundane, the mundane power versus magical power. And Christine did the very bold prediction that magic would be gone. Yeah, totally nailed that one. (laughs) So I want to like, I want to see where we stand with the like, the sense of like the philosophy of of Game of Thrones, the television show. Like I also meant to like say that again, which we said in season seven, we are talking about the television show. We may, you know, bring up stuff from the books. um, But what we're discussing right now is the television show, not the books. I mean, we can't really discuss the end of the books because we haven't gotten them yet and maybe won't ever, but, (laughs) but, but, um, and I haven't read a single book. So, so I wanted to like, see where we think, where we feel like, like Christine and I talked a lot about this, like about how the magic at the end of season seven was like so ramped up that it, that it was a really interesting question in our minds about season eight of like, how would the story find a way to balance um, magical power and political power? And I Mm -hmm. wanted to see what you all think about, like, I mean, we could both talk about how they did it, and if we like how they did it, but, but I'm, but I may be more asking the question of like, what do we feel like is the like ending philosophy about those, those balances? I feel that Game of Thrones' take on magic has always been inconsistent. Mm-hmm. And I'm yeah. say, I, I have the same feeling about the books mm-hmm. and I, I clarify only to, to emphasize that this is not a, oh, boo on the show sure, this sure. is just i think part interwoven into the fabric of the story um on the one hand i think uh magic is used in a very kind of practical mundane way mm-hmm. that, that dragons are weapons of mass destruction mm-hmm. and so whoever has the dragons has power and that's a very sort of anthropological way of looking at magic. Well, okay, if dragons existed, how would they impact the social structure and mm-hmm. uh, impact the landscape of the world? On the other hand, we have Rolor, uh, the Lord of Light, and the War for the Dawn, which feels much more like the Odyssey and the Iliad in which gods are using humans as puppets to achieve certain ends Mm -hmm. and initially i took that to be more uh the way people were claiming gods on their side to justify their actions but no the lord of light is very much real i think or at least the power of the red god is tangible and so we have this lord of light trying to battle the white walkers it sounds and using Melisandra and John and uh, Beric Dondarrion to to do whatever he wants. And these are two very different takes on magic. One very much grounded in, you know, kind of reality, if you will, and the other sure. one much more mythological. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, and almost theological. Felt... Yeah. I'm sorry? I was saying, yeah, and almost theological with the, with the Lord of Light. Like it was... Yeah, I I think uh, potentially we could talk about this later, but I thought Melisandre's arc was a really, for me, beautiful meditation on faith. Absolutely. Um, Yes. But uh, anyways, I never felt like it it entirely jived. It felt like two distinctly different takes on magic getting smushed into the same story. I actually like the idea of the two. I mean, I've always I've always enjoyed that smushing. Um, personally, 
Cool. And I mean, and I think it's interesting because I mean, we never found out what the red comment really meant, which I loved also. Like I always God, I loved, forgot about the red I comet. Always That's loved right. Yeah. That the red comet was like everyone wanted to interpret the red comet to mean something for their own religion slash magical awakening. And the thing that they maybe hinted at, I mean, it's just, it's hard for me at this point. See, this is where I get negative. It's hard for me right now to give the writers credit for stuff because I feel sure. like so many things got dropped literally off of clips, like things that seemed important that it's really hard for me, but I don't care. Like just, you know, Elizabeth very much knows my feelings about death of the author. Christine and Petra probably also like, I really don't actually give a shit about what their intent was. That's just never a way of talking about a story <laughs> that is interesting to me. I mean, I can criticize creators of stories all I want for what implications their stories have, but I just don't really give a shit. What I, all I care about is the text. So in the text with Melisandre, it's really interesting because, you know, she was like superpower. Right. I mean, just if we're taking that part of the magic. So like, you know, she created like a shadow baby murder baby thing. That was right. pretty big deal. <laughs> like That was a long time ago. That was a really big deal. She seemed almost like, you know, flawed in her humanity, which is what I've always loved about her. Like she makes mistakes. But when you get down to like mm. the nitty gritty of like actual magic power, she's got a lot of it. Um, and it, I thought it was really interesting. Like one of the things I did like about the Battle for Winterfell, which I'm just going to call all the episodes the wrong thing because I still didn't integrate. I know. With our I'm names. sorry. No, no. Yes, I started that. That's okay. <laughs> the thing that I'm still going to like the thing that was fascinating to me was that she actually struggled to make fire. Yes. And so we don't and know. And that seemed tied to her faith at the time too, and her understanding of her own religion and faith and doubt in her god and that was all beautiful or the diminishing of her god i mean that's another way to look at it sure. that it's like it's like it's simultaneously interesting in that it could be about melisandra it could also because we're in a world with with actual physical magic it's not just about faith so it could actually in that world be like we lost one dragon like there is a lot of implications of the story oh, that the birthing sure. of the dragons was actually an awakening of magic that you, you there's like mm. a there's a chicken and egg thing there. There's like were the dragons born because of, of the comet and the awakening of magic or did the birthing of the dragons actually precipitate that very thing? Right. So if we if you know the world of the living have lost one dragon, did they perhaps lose some percentage of their magic abilities. So that's also that an option. Again, mm -hmm. story didn't choose to put this in a place of like satisfying ambiguity. They chose to just like be like, whatever. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we can sit here and like say anything pretty much. I feel yeah. like because yeah. the text isn't really helping us in that realm. If we don't know if that's a thing about diminishing faith or diminishing magic. And it's, I feel like it even could be both. And that works as well. Her lack of faith may not just be from her own mistakes, because she made a lot of mistakes and like seemed just fine with it for a little while. So like there was that. I mean, Shireen was a big fucking mistake. And I think, you know, I feel like burning a small child should make anyone question themselves if they realize yep. anything about that. I mean, not just that it didn't right. work, but um, it's possible that the diminishing of magic is also influencing her faith. Like, or her energy to stay alive and be of the faithful. You know what I mean? Her her mm -hmm. ability to hold herself together to be part of this story. It's so interesting because for me, I always think that their faith probably sprung up because they couldn't explain the magic that they had or the mm -hmm. magic that they were able to um, to produce. So I've, I've always been of the opinion that um, faith tends to be, and this is very controversial, so I apologize for anybody that I offend by saying this, but that faith tends to be an explanation for the science that we just don't have the language or the knowledge to um, explain yet. Um, and I do say that as a practicing Christian. So, um, but I, it was interesting with Melisandre in particular because I didn't see her as diminished you know, when she came back to Winterfell and during and watching that episode with friends, I kept saying how 
you know, she went back to Volantis and leveled up. Yeah, that's true. Oh, you did say uh-huh. that. That's true. She she came back so much more powerful. And I think that bringing Jon Snow back really energized her faith. Um, and she had recognized that she had made mistakes before in her, you know, interpretation of what she saw in the flames. Mm -hmm. But she knew that when she brought him back and he was walking the ramparts of Winterfell and, you know, that those those visions that she had seen Mm -hmm. that she was so disturbed by when she saw his dead body. Now, it's like I saw him walking the ramparts of Winterfell. Like, how could he be dead? Mm -hmm. And she helped bring that about. Um, It humbled her. Because she knew she had made so many terrible mistakes, but at the in the end, the visions were right. It's just that she was wrong. Right. So um, I think she came back to Winterfell with a lot of humility, and we were beginning to see that in season seven in her conversation with Varys in Dragonstone. Um, but she came back leveled up. Everybody seems to come back to Winterfell with more powers, which is mm. great. <laughs> <laughs> And Melisandre was definitely one of them. And I think that, you know, her exit wasn't necessarily a diminish, a diminishing of the, um, her faith or her power or, you know, magic in the world. I think she was just ready. Mm-hmm. You know, she yes. had done her job. She had completed her mission. Um, and I was grateful for the way her story ended. It made sense. But there are so many other stories involving magic that the end of it made no flippin' sense to me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like Bran and his capabilities of war game. Why didn't we see more of that this season? Arya and her capabilities to steal faces and to put them on and to become, you know, dead people. We didn't see any of that this season. There's There's just so much magic that could have been utilized. Um, And I was very confused as to why it wasn't. I didn't understand the point. I didn't understand the point of John being resurrected. John being resurrected is something that I was thinking about today that just does not actually have a larger story to it. What is the Lord of Light's purpose for Bran Stark that Jon Snow came back in order to bend the knee for him? He was going to make a comment about Melisandre mm-hmm. in terms of uh, faith. Christine, I thought it was interesting that you brought up the God of the Gaps approach to viewing religion because I thought. Wait, is God of the, the Gaps the idea of like things we can't explain? That God, yeah. Okay. Like, faith in God exists to explain the gaps in our knowledge. And as those gaps shrink, so does the need for religion, mm-hmm. which I don't agree with. Um, but a lot of people do, understandably so. Mm-hmm. I thought Melisandre was a really beautiful rebuttal to that stance because very often in fiction, people lose their faith when things don't go their way, which makes me very frustrated because I think that that's a very shallow representation of religious faith. Mm-hmm. Uh, as soon as soon as you know Santa Claus in the clouds doesn't deliver what you want, you stop believing. Right. And I absolutely love that Melisandre messes up, realizes that she has been on the wrong path, mm-hmm. and becomes disillusioned. But that that does not diminish her faith when she talks to John before the Battle of the right. Bastards. He says, "What sort of god would?" let me die and then bring me back only to die again. Right. Alessandra goes, the one we have. Right. Yes. And that's such a beautiful line because it's not about what, anyways, I can go on a long tangent about this, yeah. but I thought that her loss of faith in herself, but her, her the fact that she retained faith in her God yeah. was mm-hmm. really lovely. And I took the lighting of the trenches to be kind of like a microcosm of her faith she's she's chanting and praying and going okay this is this really needs to work roll or right. on now and then it did the fire bursts forth we got that beautiful shot of the flames reflected in her eyes and it's like all right roll is not doing things the way you you want him to mm-hmm. and yet 
your faith persists. Right. Yeah. Melisandre is one of the storylines that really works for me. Yeah. I find her fascinating. I have found her fascinating throughout. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm really happy that her story feels like it had like a, a thread that wasn't unraveling in season eight and that ended. I mean, I think I feel like maybe I'm just happy with the people who died earlier in season eight. (laughs) Somehow they got stories that had endings that feel like real proper endings. Um, But hers is really beautiful. And I think the in answer to what you were saying, Christine, is that the way I've always seen both magic and religion in in the world of Game of Thrones is is almost like neighborhoods. It's not the job of Reholer to answer the questions about Bran Stark because he he exists. I mean, I have questions about Bran Stark. They are huge. But I don't think that those are related to the Red Priestesses because I feel like it's almost like some religions slash magical systems cover certain characters in certain parts of the world and other religions slash magical forces cover different ones. So it's like Bran is related to the old gods. Sure. Yeah. I was wondering about how we were connected. Right. So it's, I mean, it's a very complex system and I feel like it's, it's, it's a really interesting structure in both the books and the show in that uh, you could look at their world in terms of our world. And like, there are conflicting religions that, that, you know, that you kind of have to pick one. And Mm -hmm. I feel like I've always felt like in their world, you actually, have these kind of, I don't know if neighborhoods are overlapping magical systems. I, sorry, as the person who is not actually um, personally religious, I will absolutely use, and I I really like the differentiation between practical magic and religion in the show, but I will Mm -hmm. kind of use those two things interchangeably because I I guess because I'm not a person of faith myself uh, and yet totally open to the world, to a world that's beyond our mundane world kind of in the general, sure. in the general. So it's for, for me, my experience of Game of Thrones is that magic and religion um, are not necessarily one and the same, but like maybe have a more fluid, more porous boundary between each other than, than maybe sure. how some people see it. But I do see that like you can have certain characters, certain storylines, certain aspects of this story, certain aspects even of one battle be controlled by the Lord of Light and some of them controlled by the old religion, which I think I feel like the people, the children of the forest are related to that. I don't necessarily, I don't, I'm not a Unitarian, I guess, in the world of Game of Thrones. (laughs) Like, I don't, I don't see like, like whatever is animating, you know, the world of the children of the forest is necessarily the same as the Lord of Light. I see those. Well, the Lord of Light seemed to me to be very invested in the battle against the Night King. Like he seemed to be in in the actual song of Ice and Fire. Like he was in that song. Um, As are the Children of the Forest, though. They they also are part of that story. That that is true. Yeah, yeah, that is true. Certainly from, from the the origins of it. Um, I saw with Melisande. I I thought the lighting of the trenches was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen on television. I thought that depiction was just gorgeous. And it seemed to me, especially going back to Petra, as you were saying, when she was talking to John, you know, this is the God we have. And after talking to Sir Davis, when Sir Davis clearly thinks that her God is a monster, like the doubt that I saw in her eyes was not about her faith in that God, but her faith that that God was good and that that God actually cared about mankind oh, and was going to show up for her and through her in that moment when there was so much writing on it. And that's why when the flames finally lit, I was a weeping mess, frankly. It was just beautiful. Wow. Oh, that is really interesting. Yeah, I definitely saw her doubt as more personal doubt. Like, is her... Her she had ability. seen too much, I think, for her to like actually doubt that her God was there. Oh, no, or no, had not the that kind of doubt. Just... Her doubt in mm-hmm. her ability to read the will of her God. Like that's the, I've never seen her doubt being in the power of her God, but sure. in her ability to, as a human being, which is what she is, make the right choice. I mean, that's that was what she said over and over again it was basically this, you know, the signs were there. I just read them wrong. Which is, you know, which yeah. ties into, I think, a whole the whole worldview of Game of Thrones this is another one of our topics about about destiny, about fate, about about prophecy, 
which is like, I think Game of Thrones is just like, you know, prophecy is some dangerous business and you all should yeah. really respect this shit. And I think that that's a huge part of Melisandre's story is that is that she is the example, you know, as opposed to Cersei, who like was like, you know, like give give me prophecy because I want knowledge for power. Melisandre came at prophecy from a very different place, a place of humility, a place of wanting to serve. Mm -hmm. And both of them read prophecy incorrectly. And the difference is that Melisandre became more and more humble because she kept getting it wrong. So I don't think it ever was her not believing in her God. It was her worry that she was not the correct vessel for sure. that God's purpose. Or that she could get in God's way? Possibly. I mean, again, like, if she's like, like mess up a plan? She, she started, I mean, I love this about her art. She started so arrogant. Mm -hmm. She had so much arrogance in the beginning of this story. Yeah. And you just watch. Sexy as fuck, though. Oh, yeah. No question. I mean, <laughs> yes. There is never a doubt about, I mean, okay, except when she takes the necklace off, then she's just really old and you're like shocked. And you're like, holy shit, this poor woman has been doing this for so long. But, yeah. um, but so sure of herself. So like, and I think she's a really interesting uh, counterpoint to someone like Beric Dondarrion, who was like, didn't give a shit and like became a believer or, or, or the hound, mm -hmm. you know? Like yes. people who became believers, she started out like so sure of herself, so positive that she knows exactly what God is telling her. And then you watch her little by little lose that. Not again, not the faith in her God. She is positive that her God is super powerful. And we know he is. Right. Yeah. But, <laughs> but unsure of her own ability to be the person enacting God's will, which is a beautiful kind of humility. Okay, so let's like, let's bring it to the other side of this question is that we now talked a whole lot about the magic. But um, I mean, I think Christine and I both kind of came through seven season seven with this idea that like, that it seemed natural that um, that the magic would diminish. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of that is like Lord of the Rings influencing us, but like the idea that magic would diminish and that that um, political power, human, you know, mundane political power would take over. How do we feel about that in relation to Bran becoming king? <laughs> like, I feel like that threw a wrench in that whole idea when we kind of like, he's at, as of the end of the story, kind of the most magical being left. I think the approach to magic is fundamentally different in Game of Thrones than Lord of the Rings. Yes. Uh, or uh, to me, I think of it, uh, it reminds me of King Arthur in, in that both, both Lord of the Rings and King Arthur have a certain, uh, how do I say this? An element of being prequels to our own world. Yes. I realize that Middle Earth is not Earth, Earth, but Middle Earth is like the English translation of Midgard, which was the Norse mythological term for Earth. So and the idea of the beginning of the Age of Man has right. a real like this is how our world right. came Absolutely. to be. Also, lines in The Hobbit imply that the reader is from that hobbits are still around anyways not gonna get into <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> point being king arthur king arthur goes to avalon and now you know when england's need is the greatest he'll come again all of this is like our world but you're looking into the past so of course magic has to diminish by the end of those stories in order for the reader us to factor into the the narrative right if I'm making sense. No, absolutely. This is like Game our Thrones. history. Exactly. Yeah. Game of Thrones doesn't have that at all. So it doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really necessitate that magic be diminished, nor does it have a magic corrupts approach. Nope. Uh, some stories treat magic like it's a sure. kind of unnatural, corrosive power didn't really do that either so oh, but maybe it did i'm gonna to hold still... on to that we should discuss that maybe it did corrupt okay go on okay uh 
So the moral value on magic is mm-hmm. maybe up for discussion, mm-hmm. but anyways, it didn't feel like magic was something that needed to be didn't, uh, ended in order for the story to have closure. I absolutely agree with you. I think that um, the way that I was addressing it was more from a narrative perspective than a than a value judgment perspective. Although I do, I do actually, I would, I don't know if I, I don't know if I have a strong opinion about this, but I would actually like to talk about magic corrupting. Um, my perspective was mostly like at the end of season seven, going, how are we going to continue the story when some people are so incredibly powerful that it's very hard. It's very hard to tell a story where you have like regular, I mean, the same thing that you have, you know, with the Marvel universe and stuff like that. It's just like when you have people who are like super duper powerful and other people who are like just kind of capable, it's really hard to tell a story um, yeah. that has some sort of balance to it. I mean, just, just again, from a narrative perspective, that becomes, that becomes a hard story to, to tell because you could ultimately just be like okay well let's just portion off like we'll just partition off the people who aren't magical because clearly what's the point um of them and and then we'll just make this about the ultra magical people like i think in our episode seven i mean our season seven discussion i mean hilarious for me to have said that now that i've seen season eight but i was like basically we just could make this about be about daenerys and, and the night king because they're the two most powerful people and we just like have them fight and then whoever wins wins and then we're done um clearly that is not how it worked out but it also didn't work out that magic exactly went away uh from a storytelling perspective i think what they did was the shortcut of making someone like bran super powerful but also inexplicably, not really. <laughs> like, so there's the that. problem with Bran for me is that, of course, yes, he's very highly magical now. Um, and I think it's very interesting that he is carrying all of this history in him and the actual history of what happened, not what people said happened. Except sometimes he just doesn't know things randomly, which right. is very frustrating to me. Like, you know everything or you don't know everything, but... Th- this just like oh i sometimes have memories of things that happened and sometimes i'm surprised by things oh you don't say i didn't realize it ha- what do you mean they were married i didn't know this thank you sam like that was a little but anyway um what was interesting to me about putting bran on the throne uh besides the eye roll it was <laughs> just <laughs> what was not that he carried it our stories or whatever it was, although it was a nice little speech, but that he had that line a few episodes back. I don't really have wants anymore. And that was was what was interesting. What makes him, I think an interesting and a safe King is not only that he has the wisdom of all of these things that screwed us up in the past, but he doesn't have any desires of his own. Like that's what fucked us with all of the other rulers is that they had they put themselves first and they couldn't not do that they had to put you know wanting to be loved or wanting to be feared or just ruling or whatever it was but their selfishness cost the kingdom in a way that bran won't but is bran like how long is this guy gonna be around i feel like is a problem too this is going to be the last good king of Westeros. Like we're not solving anything here, as far as I'm concerned. We give us give ourselves like a little bit of time to hopefully maybe sort our shit out a little bit more. But it's a very short term band aid solution for Westeros. Yeah. I feel like which was not addressed. Right. It was not. Well, okay. So I wanted to bring up two things about this. One is like, do we actually like the idea of a of a government based on basically negating humanity? Like there have been lots of political governmental structures based on that idea. And generally those are in dystopian stories. Like those are oh, <laughs> like having a robot be the ruler. Right, because basically, like usually when we have it a, it's kind of like a robot. When we ruler. have, when we have a government based on negating like, human urges and human and humanity, uh, that is usually that often is end up being a dystopian story. But what I sure. really like the, the wrench that I want to throw into all of this is, um, I feel like I don't remember who was saying, I would cite whoever was saying stuff like this, either on Twitter or in private conversations, but just don't remember. But this hint that like, or maybe this like totally rational question you're going to come up with is like, did Bran maneuver all of this? Like, did he know more than he actually told us? 
and was like was all of this did all of this end up like basically could you look at season eight as like Bran subtly or not so subtly maneuvering everyone into the places he needed for exactly this outcome for him to become king why do you think i came all this way exactly so that's the textual yeah. line that suggests it and then i did start like Lauren Sarner and I have been having fun talking about this, like, just basically this kind of, like, not exactly evil brand, but, like, but this, like, overlord brand version. I fucking hate brand. <laughs> brand withholds information from people all the time for his own end to manipulate them, right. and I don't so like it. So the whole it. thing with him saying to Sam, like, you need to tell John, there's just, like, a lot of moments yep. like that, and it's just, like... You can. I started to rewatch season eight specifically today with that in mind of like, can you watch this season with the idea that Bran actually just was like everyone were his puppets and he maneuvered them all into the places that he wanted them to be because he had knowledge that he wasn't sharing? It actually so it here's kind where of works. I down to Bran. And I don't subscribe to this whole theory that he was manipulating everybody um, simply because I think Bran is the personification of fate. Okay. Oh. He, he knows how everything is going to end, not just his story, but like stories to come down the line, right? Like he, what is it that they say that like your life is already written? Like he has read that book. He has right. read everyone's book. He knows what's, going to happen so i don't think he needs to manipulate anything he just needs to like, sit and watch it happen exactly he could just sit there and watch it happen that's why he that's like so depressing he's going, to let, <laughs> he's, going to let, he's going to let his small council squabble over whether we're going to raise money first before we make the ships and you know how are we going to do all of these little tiny things He's not going to care about that because he knows how that all ends up, but he wants them to think that they have control over what's happening because mm. that's just how life works. Like if we all knew how our stories were going to end, would we necessarily get out of bed, right? Like we need to think that we have some control over our lives. So, so I don't think Brand needs to manipulate anything. He knows how... Mm the story is going to go and he's going to let it play out. Sure. Um, that's just my take. That's crazy depressing, but that totally works also <laughs> as and it, it works as a reading of season eight. What Petra, what were you going to say? I, I, I'm with you, Christine. That's kind of how I look at it. Well, okay. No, 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 no. I, I think the more, you know, why was Brand's story written the way it was? It's because the writer's, really ran out of steam yeah. and didn't know what else sure. to do. So there are Rough. a few things where, you know, why did Bran say this? Because the, because he had to so that the plot could go where it did. Sure. Uh, I think the idea of Bran being a master manipulator is a lot of fun. But it's I don't way think more satisfying. That that it's way more satisfying. <laughs> well, but there's no setup in Bran's character to lead him to be a puppet master. It's not like yeah. if, if, he, if when he was a little kid in season one, he'd had a scene where he was like, how many people have to die, Maester right. Ryan, for me to become king? Oh, like, right. oh, no, sure. I, no, I disagree. I don't think it has to be an integral part of his character. I think it could be something that, that came out of his, his increased knowledge as the Three-Eyed Raven. I think that like that a lot of times, I mean, again, going back to like generally, you know, dystopian stories, like <clears throat> when you get some sort of like uh, over powerful overlord who is not connected to human emotion, who is like divorced themselves from human, from valuing human emotion, and then they're positive that they know better. So like, I don't... I don't think that has to have anything to do with who Bran was as a child or Bran was up until the point that he became the Three-Eyed Raven. Um, because I think that I, I take him at his word that he is no longer really Bran when he I know it's like hard to think because he was a really cute kid. But I think if there's anything true about Bran, it is what he says about not really being Bran anymore. And I think that an impartial uh, being that is not doesn't get actually give a shit about human emotionality anymore 
would very easily I mean again I'm sounding like I really want to like say that this theory is the theory I'm saying it's a theory that works for me on many levels without saying that it's like the answer to Game of Thrones it just happens to be something that works for me because I do and I think the text supports it I think that the text supports the idea of a character like that um, again, not necessarily. He can also just let things happen. But there are moments where he makes choices to that help um, that help motivate other characters to be where they are when they are. I do think I I think I disagree with your assessment that Bran no longer gives a shit about human emotion. <laughs> um, he himself is detached from it, but he does say to Sansa that he's sorry for what happened to her uh, which isn't what she needs to hear at that moment but he oh still cares goodness, you're this way. <laughs> he still you're cares way. and acknowledges Maybe. that <laughs> what his sister experienced was awful Maybe. Sure. Um, he tells Theon that he's a good man and he that's thanks him because of. Yeah. he knows that that's what Theon needs to hear right but knowing what um, someone needs to hear in the moment also I mean again I, we don't need to go down this road completely but see, well, I think saying what Theon someone needs to hear might he also be do, good for motivating them to do things but, but, to, I I, I, but, but to a great end I would think to a great end, right? So he's positioning, say he is manipulating these people, right? Mm -hmm. For argument's sake. The end of the story is where everybody is at their most happy, at least like the people who have survived, right? So like the the question is, who is going to be on the Iron Throne? The person who makes the most sense in terms of like the laws of Westeros don't want to do it. He's never happy in leadership, even though he's a natural right. leader. The happiest place he's ever been was north of the wall with his little redhead, having a grand old free time. But that option is completely off the table for him, unless things unfold the way they unfolded. Yeah, but a lot of authority, you know I mean? a lot of authoritarian, dic- authoritarian dictatorships work exactly the way that you're describing. Like the idea, I think I just gave Danny's right. like little speech, right? But in, like a lot of, <laughs> a but way. the idea. I mean, it was the idea of like people trading trading free will for safety. Like you're exactly describing a situation like that. Like people are messy, humans are messy. They've been messy. Like we've spent seven seasons of watching messy people make a fucking mess of everything, and then we say, oh, okay. Well, all we need to do is take normal people out of the situation and we get a person who can just like see the future and know the future and you know and kind of take emotionality and all of these like all of this like ambition and stuff out of it again i it's just one way this story could this one way you could read this story sure. and i think it actually works as a reading of the story and it's depressing as hell because basically it's you know, then we're just in like 1984. Like we're just like in a world right. like that, where it's just like you take out or you know, or any dystopian story. It's like you take out love, you take out ambition, you take out emotionality. And yeah, things are going to be more peaceful. But like, do we have free will anymore? Okay, everyone's raising their hands. Go, I'll stop yes. talking. I just like threw this thing out that I don't like really feel strongly about, but it kind of yeah. works. And I think it's an interesting way to look at the story. Okay, I have two things. The first thing goes back to what I think Petra was going say about Bran, which is that he might say things that happen happen to motivate other people or to fit other people's motivations. But I think that he speaks those things from compassion. Like I think what he said to Theon was not necessarily what motivated Theon to do what mm-hmm. he did. Theon was going to do it anyway. And when when Petra, when you said it was what Theon needed to hear, not what he needed to hear to move him to action, but what he needed to hear to Heal. To yeah, to, to to feel that he died a noble death and was a good person because he never, you know, it, it was this idea that you, um, Christine, you talked about that beautiful scene on the on the beach, or no, it was in the throne room, wasn't it? Um, oh, which yeah. ended up being so heavily thematic for everything that Game of Thrones ended up telling yes. us in the last episodes about wanting to do what was good but not knowing what good was, you know. And so to, to just have Bran, who was all-knowing, say you are a good man, kind of relieves Theon of any sense of, 
but does uh, should have would have could have everything that he should have done better but before that could be it just allows him to die peacefully i'm not trying to diminish that from theon's story i'm just saying that you could look at bran in that situation not doing this from personal compassion but from a position of being like an opiate for the masses like yes he does tell everyone what they need to hear but he knows what they need to oh, hear because he knows what they need to hear because he knows their stories yeah but why would he why would he why give him an opiate if like this guy's definitely because, about to die. I know he's about to die, but he's also about to. Yeah, right, I, I mean, but happy masses. Happy masses are happy masses. I mean, it's just that simple. It's just no, he's like, dead, Daphne. He's gonna be dead in like two seconds. <laughs> right. There's no need to do that if he didn't care about Theon. Right, if he didn't I agree. have that emotion and compassion himself. Totally fine. I don't buy the idea that Bran is being compassionate. It's funny because I actually wrote an essay for our blog about how Bran is becoming yeah. more human than he was I, after the sure. first two episodes, and I don't actually buy it anymore. <laughs> It does well, not work for me. Thing had oh, oh, yeah, to yeah, Petra, yeah, and then we're going yeah, to shoot yeah, to shoot to Petra. So the second thing that I had was just: Do we think that the that the showers wanted us to think that all is going to be happy and well now in Westeros with the ending? Because I did not think that that's what they were saying at all, personally. I'm sorry. And now, over to Petra. You were next. <laughs> Um, I think you make a really interesting point, Daphne, about how, yeah, the idea of the impartial robotic ruler has not been framed positively in other works. However, a big difference between Bran and Big Brother, for example, is that Bran, we have not seen Bran impose his roboticness on other people. That's true. So he himself is the way he is, but... uh, we don't see uh, on the council that he's saying anything along the lines of, hey, everyone, just listen to me. Just trust me and everything will be fine. If he'd said something along those lines, oh, absolutely. Red flags popping up everywhere. Um, that's not his approach. And yeah, uh, Liz, I don't I think the introduction of a constitutional monarchy and a demo- semi-democratic approach to electing a king, mm-hmm. queen, monarch is nice. Um, I feel like it's kind of the happiest way that they could end things, but it didn't have a utopic no. vibe. Right. It I, felt I mean, like a band on a bullet hole to me. I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead, Christine. No, no, no. I'm just saying, even beyond that, you've got Braun as master of coin. How the fuck is that going to work? Like, <laughs> I hate Braun. <laughs> you hate Braun? Petra, I liked you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Elizabeth, welcome to the Game of Thrones fandom. You can agree with people on some things and, like, absolutely disagree with them on other things. Oh, There's God, just so many characters like, and they're all so controversial. Liz is so offended right now. <laughs> I just I just thought that I thought that Braun was one of their that was just like, you know, icing for everybody. Just like, oh but here's some Braun. Yeah. It's okay. Like I okay. Wow. All right. Continue. Yeah, I guess I, I mean I'll just close close out the brand thing by just saying ultimately um any version that's not the like puppeteer brand actually means that i kind of hate the ending but i already kind of hated the ending so so we're fine (laughs) like ultimately every other version of it just sounds to me like as much as i wanted to bring up that version i don't 100 percent believe it like every other version of brand being king now is unbelievably uninteresting to me so that's it's just boring right that's it's my just problem. a boring choice that's my problem yeah. i was just trying to propose something that like maybe had some like thematic meat to it of any sort whatsoever but there isn't all right so let's uh let's move away from politics um and magic politics and magic my favorite topics and um let's go to another topic that i adore which is about personal growth of the idea of, of personal arcs and people who took control of their lives or didn't. I feel like, Petro, this is wide open for you with your favorite character. <laughs> sure. So character arcs, I love a good character arc. They're very difficult to uh, to achieve, to do well, to finish well. Um, and the topic of agency is a huge one in Game of Thrones because the social system doesn't really allow for individual choices. Um, so there is this reoccurring concept in Game of Thrones of escaping your past or 
it's, it's more than escaping your past, but these characters endure trauma. And a major question in their stories is what happens next? What kind of person do you become? How much choice do you have over that? And I think uh, Daenerys is an interesting example of a character who, for the vast majority of the show, very much tried to break her own personal wheel, the legacy of her of her family, and ultimately failed. Obviously, for me, Theon Greyjoy is a, a example of a character who ultimately took control over his life. What I find so poignant about Theon Greyjoy is that he had such little control over the early part of his life. And that did not turn him into a sympathetic Harry Potter kind of guy. It turned him into a dick, Mm -hmm. Uh, which is what realistically happens to most people who grow up under such difficult circumstances. But his big thing was he was too much of a Greyjoy to be a Stark and too much of a Stark to be a Greyjoy. And that conflict drove a lot of his self-destruction and i find it so beautiful at the end of season seven when he's given sort of this this blessing of being a stark and a Greyjoy, which is not a concept that exists in westerosi society right. you cannot have allegiance to house Greyjoy mm-hmm. and house stark mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um it doesn't really jive with the political <laughs> landscape and i'm actually really happy that theon died before he had to choose between serving daenerys or john because i think his head would have exploded oh, uh, i think yeah. theon died at the perfect time in the perfect way he died <laughs> perfectly he, really time did. Was. <laughs> he he ducked out right before it all went to hell anyways mm-hmm. positive positive thoughts um, <laughs> no that's very positive he had a positive death not a lot of characters got that um, that's true. I, w- I would have ultimately liked it if he'd had a more Greyjoy centric death, but by the sea, he, mm-hmm. he did. He, he oh, died too far from the sea. Yeah. Oh, too right. too far from the sea. He really did. Yeah. But he, you know, what happened was he had this closure with his conversation with John at the end of season seven. And this once profoundly selfish man spent the rest of his storyline helping the people that he loved. So his sister's in distress. He has to. He he goes and he saves her. And then this. So th- the Greyjoy side of his identity is taken care of. Mm-hmm. Now he has to go and he has to take care of the Starks, who yeah. he loves, and he dies protecting those that he loved, it, with this rebuilt identity that has no real uh, context in Westerosi culture. A Stark and a Greyjoy, but it doesn't matter. He is who he is. He loves who he loves. And um, this man whose whose story for so long was defined by his selfishness and his single minded desire to serve himself dies, spends the the end of his story showing love for others. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's very tied into something Christine and I talked about about season seven is the idea of ruling versus serving is that he spent, you know, a lot of time resenting that he wasn't ruling, trying to rule, and then he became a character that served. I mean, he was forced into that servitude, which is something different. Sure. Then, and then he actually, um, in my eyes, one of, one of the aspects of agency for Theon is that he came out of enforced servitude and abuse and actually chose to serve from a place of choice, which I think is really beautiful. That's a really beautiful place that he, I'm not, and I think, I mean, I, one of my favorite things in season eight um, is the tie between him and Sansa, like their reunion and all of that. And it's, it, yeah. there's a similarity there is that she also was forced to, into a place of servitude, both by just by, by the gender role she chose. And then of course, through yeah. her abuse and she also chose service as a, as a leader. Like she chose to rule as a person who embraces that ruling as service and not mm. as power. I feel like it's you have more little... faith in Sansa than I do, but all right. Okay. No, that's totally fine. 
<laughs> I, I am willing to admit that my love of Sansa might be beyond what Sansa is actually worthy of. I don't know. I feel like Sansa could go full on Cersei on us and just like try to take the throne from Bran at any time, at any point. And I would be like, yeah, no, that tracks. No, Christine, did I hurt you? I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> oh I hurt her. I'm sorry. I'm okay. literally wounded right now. I'm so I, sorry. I not her brother. Bran is not her brother anymore, and Sansa could tell herself that very easily. Oh my I think. god. Bran says himself that he's not Bran anymore. We just talked about that. I well, think she, she also could. says in she's in the C- series finale, she says, I love you, little brother. I always will. That's true. It's right before she asks him to uh free the North. Sansa became the most stark stark. After starting out not wanting to be the most Stark Stark. Really? I think in the beginning, all she cared about was being a lady, but not a northern lady. She was focused on being Joffrey's lady, being the queen, you know, all of that. And not really embracing her northern roots until her father was murdered. You know, then she starts going to the God's Wood. then she mm-hmm. eventually be- becomes focused on getting Winterfell back and, you know, focused on the country, n- not the country, sorry, focused on her family, focused on the North and serving the people of the North and really being thoughtful in her preparation for the war, making sure that not only is there armor, but there's leather on the armor oh, God, because of the cold, like, you know, it's the, it's the practical caring that she has. You right. know, in the war room after the long night, you know, she's like, you want an army? Let them rest. They just mm-hmm. fought, a, a, you know, the battle for their lives. A well-rested army will do you, you know, better service. And Danny flies off the handle. And she's like, are you serious, dude? Like, these are your mm-hmm. people. Let them sleep before you make them march. Um, and it's, and it's again, this common sense caring and leadership that I think is just very northern and practical and Ned Stark mm. to the bone and Catelyn Stark to the bone as well. I think she's, she is a map of her. Catelyn, I see a lot of Catelyn. Okay. I will give you that. Yeah. So, so I don't think that she would be the one she could, she could be a one to turn on Bran. I mean, Littlefinger and Cersei have definitely influenced her, mm-hmm. but she has taken the best parts of them for ruling, for being a leader, and still remaining a true Stark at the end of the day, with the exception of not being able to hold an oath for shit. See, I think <laughs> I think that I, I don't actually see Sansa, and maybe this is me having too much faith in her. I don't see her wanting to rule the Seven Kingdoms. Um, I think that a huge part of Sansa's personal makeup is about survival and that she, um, she's a very much like in black sales terms, she's a very much like build a wall and protect your own kind of person more so than a take over the world kind of person. Sure. Um, so I, I, I can't, I mean, she, she used all of the lessons of political manipulation that she learned from her abusers to get to the place that she is but Mm -hmm. i still see again like the thing the thing about worrying about the food and worrying about the armor and that is that her whole thing is have the north protect the north serve her people as a leader like she's really she ends up being i i see her as ned's daughter i mean you you all did say catlin but i and that's obvious but i see her as ned's daughter as well is that she she sees the role of leadership as that of service and, and that it serves the dual purpose for her personally. Like I think her only personal need at this point is like not have people come and like rape and abuse her basically. Right. And, and so the road to that is to be a good leader to her people. So there is a personal aspect to those life choices, but that ultimately the way that works for her is a very northern way it's a very it's a very house stark way of looking at the world is that we will live somewhat separate and i will serve my people and therefore i will be safe myself as well i don't disagree with you i just think 
that there's a little bit more to her desires because Sansa, I think, is still a very ambitious woman. Mm -hmm. Um, And I, I don't think it's just about survival. It's a very, very strong motivator for her, 100%. But I think she still had that ambition of being a great lady. And yeah. now mm-hmm. she's gone one You're step right, above queen. that, and she's right. now queen of the North. And mm-hmm. I just, I love the fact that it's of the North and just the North. Because she just so rejected everything northern she was she was so obsessed with being a southern lady yes, and just yeah. all the women of king's landing and all of that and and this is just her coming back to her roots celebrating them and being content with just that right with just the north and that is her being smarter than cersei smarter than little finger and and just right. rising above and being content with with the north which is half of the country anyway right and her coronation outfit is absolutely oh, an expression of that it's so yeah. fucking good <laughs> it's all of her siblings including john yep. it's all of them in one and a true celebration of the stark family and the north oh it was such a which again goes back dress. to the whole beauty of who she is because she has always expressed what is going on with her internally through the fact that she made her own outfits, the fact that that like crazy ass necklace, like was it Kim who brought that up in our, our Stark sisters panel? Like that, that necklace is supposed to be a representation of needle. That's her needle that Aria has her version of a needle and that that necklace is Sansa's version of a needle that feels very like armor like, I mean, in season eight, she, you know, is totally wearing outfits up until the end that look like armor. But the idea that she's incorporating needlework with something that feels a little punk, a little bit like a little bit, you know, aggressive. Um, And that I, I really like that Sansa has transformed herself completely, but part of her transformation has been to, to redefine the things that defined her from the very beginning. Yes. I see a lot of uh, Sansa's arc as being kind of encapsulated by her line in the pilot where she says to her mother, but I would be queen one day and then actually becoming queen in Mm -hmm. the series finale because her motivation behind wanting to be queen changes drastically. Mm -hmm. I think she goes from being an idealist to a pragmatist. Yes. Absolutely. Because I think a lot of she gets a lot of uh, heat in the first season for being superficial. And I she's not her best self in the first season. But I I think she I can't blame her for wanting to wear gorgeous gowns and engage in all of the pageantry of the South because she's a teenage girl. She's a teenage girl that was told that she is the Disney princess. So, of course, she's going to want all of that stuff. But also, I mean, the pageantry of the South is amazing. No it's joke. just that in addition to all of that, she experiences the horror. And so mm-hmm. quite understandably, I think anyone would crave home under those circumstances. Sure. And so the North comes to represent safety and love and, and all of the things that she lost when she mm-hmm. moved South and um and so all of that well and she that actively love... took that home back cuz when she first got back to that home it yeah, wasn't right. all of those things for her so she she like she actually she earned that oh, throne she, she for it. right cuz she Absolutely. took she took that home back from the invaders who had who had who had defiled the home that she had yearned for which is also amazing Abs- Absolutely I think the north became a symbol of of what she lost mm-hmm. And that's why she worked hard to get it back. And so when she becomes queen of the North, all of the, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of sad to say, but her love of pageantry and of excess had been stripped away yeah, from her. And she true. was a practical woman who cared about leather on armor and feeding armies. And she still retained her, her fashion sense, which was great (laughs) but a much you know aside from that much more of a traditional northern lady which kind of sad to me to be honest 
uh, but but a very realistic product of everything that she's been through. And I like that Arya balances her out by not staying in Winterfell. Because I think there could be something a little bit mm, less than perfect about, oh, don't dream too far. Don't stray sure. too far from home. Um, sure. That Sansa does wind up <clears throat> living in her ancestral home while Arya says, no, my place is elsewhere. Yeah. That's not me. Yeah. <laughs> That's not me. <laughs> so good. Um, yeah, that is a really great pow- counterbalance. Um, and, and is important in, you know, in a realm where we have, yeah, where feel like th- what the sh- story has told us ultimately about Daenerys and Cersei is that, you know, uh, is that women with ambition will be punished. I mean, ultimately, that is part of this hmm. story. I mean, again, I love Cersei's story until very recently. I mean, I, I guess this is where I, you know, say my part that I have to say about women and POV is that mm-hmm. um, I do... I feel like there was a point in this story where they just literally turned off the point of view, the internal, the internal narrative, the internal characterization of pretty much all of the women, except for Arya. Um, They just turned that off for the story so that they could get to the, like move these female characters to the places they needed them to go. Um, But for most of this season, we, all of these women who for seasons have been, really complex characters that I feel like I was really invested in the complexity of them and their internal struggles and the things that made them do good things and the things that made them do bad things. And, and like, I was really equally invested in all of those motivations and all of that internal struggle. And in this season, we got a little bit of that in the beginning and then they just literally just like flipped a switch and we didn't get to see that for any of them after a certain point. Can I say something about the women of Game of Thrones? Go for it. That has yes. bothered me since season one. Oh, great. Okay. Because <laughs> oh, I just made it sound like it was awesome and now I'm terrible. But yes, <laughs> let's talk about what was problematic about them from the beginning. Well, for me, I am sick to death of women who have children being defined almost exclusively as mothers. Yes. I had that conversation over line- dinner. Yeah. There is a line in the first book where I believe Jamie says, oh, you women, I swear, giving birth dulls your senses. Something very vaguely to that effect of basically Mm -hmm. once you pop out a baby, there goes your brain. And it's intended to frame Jamie as like, oh, he's not a great, lovable guy. You know, he's kind of sexist. But George plays into that very trope and so does the the show um Mm -hmm. i know a lot of people really love catelyn i I have mixed feelings about her (laughs) sorry i'm laughing because i just stepped into uh you just you 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 just stepped into my quicksand (laughs) i do not love catelyn go ahead (laughs) you do not i do not love catelyn no okay so i i have a really hard time with her obsession with being i'm so sorry catlin fans listening yes her, her right, emphasis right. on being a mother while treating john and theon coldly i, love I have a you, very Petra. very I love hard so time <laughs> this is my thing i i get that she's a flawed complex character but I, I have very little patience for a woman who so exclusively defines herself by being a mother and then treats two little boys growing up under her care coldly. Mm-hmm. I cannot reconcile that. The story centers her motherhood as, I mean, I think that's part of the problem. It's not just, because you could have a woman, oh, you could have an interesting, interesting, you could have an interesting character uh, who, who like identifies herself as a great mother and is a kind of crappy mother in a lot of ways. And that's an interesting story. Like that's a really interesting story, right? We love, we we love me. When she had that conversation about how she couldn't a little bit love John and that made her, that makes Catelyn herself a little bit more interesting. The problem is not so much Catelyn's 
internal conflict. I mean, again, I personally happen to be a person who has a hard time with with women who really define themselves as great mothers, but are actually quite abusive to some children. But sure. aside from that, I think the problem isn't that is that the story kind of writ large in both books and show. It's not that this was posed as like, this is Catelyn's internal conflict. And that is like the essence of her story in the way that a lot like the Jamie gets an internal conflict about whether he is honorable or not. Right. That's Jamie's mm -hmm. internal conflict. And we love that story. And that's a really well-developed story that has ins and outs and ups and downs. And we go through this whole process like Catelyn, you're right. We get the one scene in the show where Catelyn's like, Oh shit, maybe I was kind of crappy. But ultimately she's really only worried about being crappy to John because she's worried that it kind of doomed her other children. Sure. So yeah, that's there's a, that's that. That's one yeah. point. And secondly, the story, just like, just like Patra just said, the story frames her as this kind of, you know, archetypal mother. And yet she is really abusive to some of the children in her care. So that's, I have to that's say, more of a story I did not perspective. Get that. I did not get that the story particularly liked Catelyn. Oh, she, it seemed to me that the story was well aware that she was stepping shit just all over the place. And I, I it was clear that Rob loved her very much and that her children loved her very much. But I, to me, my reading of the story, and I haven't read the books at all, but my right. reading of, of the, the television program was that Catelyn was not, well, I mean, not a very good mother, certainly a terrible stepmother, and also just, yeah, dooming her children time and time again by yeah. just not being properly thoughtful i suppose oh, and then so I, I the only time i think that the story did make catlin seem like she was more than that that she was a, a great and noble lady was brienne pledging herself to her mm -hmm. but even yeah. that was very complicated with other things that had nothing to do with catlin really and had everything to do with brienne Interesting. So Lauren Sarner said this to me today, that she proposed that maybe the whole thing with Catelyn is actually more of a fandom thing than a story thing. Is that the fandom has elevated Catelyn in a way that the story never did. And so we're being influenced oh, that's possible. by actually more of a fandom storyline than a, than a story storyline. I don't know. I don't know what to say about that. I'm not sure where to... I, I don't know. A lot of my opinion about Catelyn comes from the books because mm -hmm. she's a POV mm -hmm. character. She is. Oh. She is a POV character in the books. That's true. I haven't read the books for a few years, so I'm like very show oriented at this point. Yeah, and in fairness to the books, you know, POV characters are allowed to be wrong. They, you yes, know, there's sure. characters are allowed to be complex in both mm -hmm. the books and the show. Um, but her in our monologue is a lot of being a mother and how being a mother sure. is to suffer and how sad she is. And, Oh, I suffer as a wife and a daughter and a mother. And when, uh, Rob is angry at her for releasing the two hostages, mm -hmm. uh, he says after the red, <laughs> after the red wedding, uh, I'm going to send you back to Winterfell. I think that's what he tells yeah. her. Yeah. But basically you're not going to stay with my, campaign anymore and i believe she says she thinks to herself is this my punishment and i'm thinking e yes you committed high treason yeah of course there are, there, are consequences. Gal. there are consequences to your actions i know you're a mother and i know that that mm -hmm. means your ability to make rational decisions is compromised but <laughs> fucking hell catlin come on yeah and i do want to say you know Women can be flawed and obsessed with being mothers and uh, bad stepmothers and all of that. That That is not inherently problematic to me because representation really uh, works best with quantity. Right. You have a wide range of different kinds of women. That's what really matters. My problem is that mothers are kind of framed the same way. No, yeah. They're yeah, all even... obsessed with their children. Yeah. Um, grief drives them all mad. 
Mm-hmm. And their sole motivation is their children. When Tyrion is negotiating over Missandei as a hostage in season eight, in one of my least favorite scenes in the entire show, mm-hmm. very possibly my very least favorite, I'm not sure. He's, right. you know, negotiating a hostage. And what does he appeal to? Her identity as a mother. Mm-hmm. I know that you're a good person, I know that you're not a monster. You're pregnant. Yeah. They're to, they're, you know. Oh my god! I, I can't believe that. I, I like. I actually got a new thing to be upset about. <laughs> Thank I you, Petra. Know, I know there's goodness in you, sir. Say literally, there's a fetus inside you, I, and and that's it. And I'm right. thinking this is a complex character, and she's been reduced to mama. Yeah, they like, did that to Cersei all the time, though. I feel like that's oh, they absolutely. go back to that like over that and over and over. Again. Of it, they, yeah, yeah. No, um, it's true. Tyrion says to her, I think in season two, uh, oh, I think that might be your one redeeming feature: your love for mm-hmm. your children. Yeah, that and cheekbones, cheekbones. <laughs> which is a funny line. But at the same time, I do feel like we have these male writers. And I am including George in this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, who kind absolutely. of sit in front of their computers and go, ah, da, da, w- women, women, w- uh, women. Okay, they have breasts that I must describe in detail. And what else do women do? They, they pop bloss- out babies. They blossom. Great yes. characterization right there. <laughs> Good lord. No, that's yeah. no, that's totally true. I actually like it when when Cersei's story is defined outside of herself, which is most of the time, honestly. Um, I'm much more interested in her when she is motivated as a daughter than when she is motivated as a mother, which is a motivation that she shares with male characters. Like basically all of Tywin's children are extremely motivated by being by being children of this like pretty yeah. awful but super interesting dude. Um, but yeah, so that's that's true. You're right. That is a shorthand that way predates season eight. You're right. I still, yeah, I still say what I say about season eight is that, like, even that level of internal conflict has taken away from the female characters by the middle of season eight, so that we only see them as how they are beneficial or problematic to male characters yeah. from that moment on. Well, it's one of the things that's so interesting about the show, I think, is that they do so many interesting things with, like, women and with gender and with, you know, trying to, like, push the envelope on certain things. But it's, like, so patriarchal, which you have to be almost in this genre. I say you have to be. You don't it have to be. It is rare not to be. Right. I'll put it that way. Have like, to that be is, is the not, convention. Yeah. That is, I'll, I'll put it that way. That's the convention in the genre, to be steeped in patriarchy in that like medieval sense but it depends on how you create the world so the fact that westeros is patriarchal means that you have to contend with the fact that the women have to navigate a a patriarchal system which we see um definitely and and that's when i think it's good there is some you know discussion about well why do we always have to have women coming up against a patriarchal system in this fantastical environment and i think that's that's a different conversation but provided that yeah yeah, this is a it's a man's world so if a woman rises through the ranks she has to do so contending with the unfair system right um and that you know it's, it sucks for those female characters but i don't i don't take issue with that itself yeah i think that's good that seems like a healthy place to be with it when you're <laughs> approaching this kind of genre because yeah it's all it's all you get and if it would be different if they didn't contend with the patriarchy if you didn't see that having to really try to subvert things or try to assert themselves against a patriarchy. But for me, in in this show at least, seeing them do the I mean, I Brienne especially. I think Brienne is the mm-hmm. one that stands out most in my mind as like really taking issue. And Arya too to some extent. I have to say Arya doesn't do a lot for me. I know that she's everybody's darling and everybody loves Arya, but <laughs> <laughs> just doesn't do a lot for me. I don't know what to say. Um, and part of that is the show's fault. Is that like, what are you doing with the faces? Like, what are you doing though? Yeah. <laughs> she was. She had. She had. Nothing. She had a few I boring get. seasons. I feel like season eight mm-hmm. actually redeemed. For me, she's one of the characters that was 
that her very boring storyline in the middle of the show actually was quite redeemed by her season eight stuff. Um, Agreed. Yeah. I mean, I think, right. She had this whole... How was it redeemed? Um, because, okay, like my short version of Arya's arc that is interesting to me is like she was, you know, she wanted to be whatever she wanted in the beginning. And then she had the shock of her father being killed. And then she dealt mm-hmm. with all of this trauma and she became a person who embraced death. I mean, literally, like kind of in stages started to okay. embrace death more and more and more. And then... I wish they had made the Bravos part more interesting because the idea of this person who came from a pretty kind of beautiful backstory, but then had this trauma and then embraced death and then literally made death her religion. And then in Hmm. season eight to have her come back from that and start to embrace life, to watch her embrace life, like to watch her first of all, want to like her line to Gendry about how I, I know death. I want to see, you know, I want to basically go, I forget what she says exactly, but even though I watched it today, but like the, you know, that she's ready to face this version of death in the night mm-hmm. King. And then to have her be the one that yeah. literally kills death after she has turned her back on death, like in season seven, you watch her come back to Westeros and become more human in stages. Like you see her in the beginning be almost inhuman still, even when she sees Hot Pie and is confronted with one of her friends. And then mm-hmm. like little by little by little, she starts to move towards life. And then to see her in the battle in King's Landing to go from a person who came for revenge was convinced not to do that and then started to, you know, as an ineffectually as she was doing it, but still with the intention of saving people. Like she goes from a person mm-hmm. who goes to embrace death and then ends up being a person who's trying to embrace life. See, for me, it's, it's, it, I had a very similar take, but in all of the times that Aria was talking about death and learning about death and worshiping death, she was really worshiping vengeance. Yes, you're yeah. right. Like, justified totally vengeance yeah. right so mm-hmm. and and the point that hammered it home for me was her dealing with lady crane she was there to kill her she was there to be the personification of death right mm-hmm. clean death just get it done but she didn't understand the why behind it it wasn't a justified death for her right and it, she couldn't for her it had to be about vengeance it had to be about something with reason. And she just couldn't get behind killing someone she thought was good and mm-hmm. didn't and wasn't um, deserving of death. Right. So for her to come this far in worshiping, I think, vengeance and becoming the personification of vengeance, but also thankfully killing death, as Daphne said, to come to the Red Keep to literally be within feet of Cersei and crossing off one of the final names off of her list and her first, well, her second, really, father figure beyond her father is the one her to tr- say, do you really want to be like me? Her true I father. I am that. <laughs> yeah, I am that. You, do you really want to grow up to be like me? Turn around now. Now is your moment mm-hmm. to say goodbye to this. You've done enough. You don't, this is the end game. This what you're looking at right now is the end game. Do you really want that? Mm-hmm. And when she called him Sandor, I nearly lost it. I know. Yeah, that was beautiful, wasn't it? Oh yeah. That's God. the moment I needed for the two of them because I wanted their reunion to be lovey-dovey and it wasn't. And it couldn't be because that's not them. Right. That is not <laughs> that's them. That's who I wanted them to be. Um, but in that moment she was freed and I think she, she had this mission of being Arya Stark when she left the, the house of black and white. She is Arya, she is, you know, a girl's name is Arya Stark and she's going home and she went home, but I feel like she wasn't set free until that moment to be the person that she wanted to be. So I, I loved where Arya ended up, especially since 
the first Con of Thrones, I'm like, her direwolf's name is Nymeria. She's got to find out <laughs> what's the best I mean, come on. Uh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> so it's like the one prediction that I actually, you know, um, uh, managed to get right, but it's probably not going to happen in the books anyway. You don't know uh, that? We, well, I mean, again. Probably we, not. We I might never take find that out. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. No, no, no. I have faith. Listen, the one thing, the one overarching positive feeling I have from watching the show is that I cannot wait for the rest of the books. Oh, I want those like, books. I just don't know if yeah. we're going to get them. Yeah, I, I have faith. You have definitely. faith. Okay. I, okay. I will try to happen. embrace your faith, Christine. It's going to happen. But yeah, but I will read are, the shit thought, out of those books if we get them. Yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> but Arya's arc. I think moved in a beautiful progression and I like mm. she ended up. Yeah, I do too. Well, um, we can talk about Daenerys. It's funny. We talked mostly in our last episode about season seven about Daenerys, which is hilarious. We can talk about Daenerys or I'm going to end up doing that as a panel anyway <laughs> in a month and a half. And I said my piece. I mean, the one thing I felt the need to say was the thing about women in POV because I am pissed off. Do you want to hear my tweet today? My tweet that I didn't sure. plan on doing. It was like I was watching Lauren and and this other woman that I really like. So they were chatting saltily about women in Game of Thrones. And what did I end up saying? I said, oh, they were talking about Tyrion. They were pissed off about Tyrion, like having a good ending to his story. And I said, it's a, oh. I said, totally impromptu. I was not planning on doing this. I just said, it's a man's dream have the way more capable women turn out to be plain old crazy and win the whole game through exhibiting mediocrity while drinking. <laughs> That's my, yep. that is my assessment of the end of season eight. Hot take. Yep. Okay. <laughs> and what, was, what was my edit to your statement? Oh, right. And you said a white man's dream. Okay. White man's was, dream. Christine's yeah. addition Fact. to that was white man's dream. <laughs> yeah, I was like, no brown man can do that. That's not going to happen. You can aspire <laughs> to that shit, but it's not going to happen. There is just the one brown man at this point. I mean, that brown man wielded a, a lot of power. Yeah, he the, did. In the final moment. Yeah, Holy but they shit. also broke his character, and made him fucking crazy. They just decided everyone that's not oh, a white no. man, they're just like, crazy. I'm just going to make me like vengeful and crazy. He wasn't oh, crazy. He was big yeah. mad. He was big mad, but he wasn't crazy. I, I don't agree. know. I, I I think that I think there was a lot of like breakneck character arcing, but I don't think there's a whole lot of actual character breaking, especially again in a show that to me was kind of all over the fucking place most of the time, except for smart if people. If we had had several okay. more episodes, Grey Worm would totally make 100% sense for everybody. I, think. I agree. I think, well, Grey Worm always said, you are my weakness, my son, Dave Nah. Mm-hmm. No, I agree with you. They absolutely broke smart people. Like, smart people... That's true. You always, if, and I have to admit, I just didn't give a care about most of right. the no, I politics. Know. I know, like, but I just you don't know care me. That much. And, like, smart political movers, it's just like, okay. Okay, you, Liz, you were just saying that you don't watch for the political stuff. Right. Right. Particularly. Yeah. What do you watch for? Because I have no idea what people watch for. If they're not, I swear to God, this is not me. So this is true. not me being an ass. Like, I really want to know. No, what, I think that's a beautiful watch. question, Christine. I think more people should ask that question. That is a when good question. It's like, why do people go to fiction? Because everybody goes for different reasons. And a lot of people assume that everyone goes for the same reasons, which is why we're like, how do you not like this show? Well, right. it doesn't tick my boxes. So the thing that I love about Game of Thrones is that it asks a lot of questions and it makes me ask a lot of questions. I don't care about answers. I care about questions. So for oh, me, oh. yeah, like I don't care that they broke Littlefinger and they, bro- uh, it, uh, according to, I know Daphne, I know I she's like, I love you, Elizabeth. Right we are such different people. And that's part of I why don't we podcast care well together because we're so yeah, different. I don't care that much that they uh, supposedly broke Littlefinger me. or that Varys please got me. the like quick shuffle out the door that he got or that Daenerys got like switched over at breakneck speed to just like fuck all y'all and burning everything down because the questions that game of thrones asks i find fascinating questions about what we talked earlier about like magic and faith and filling in the gaps and what we understand and what we don't understand and how much control we have and what we don't what makes a good leader what is good what is right 
is there such a thing as good? Is there such a thing as right? What, how much are we defined by where we come from? And how much are we defined by what we want to be? How much can we get past where we come from, regardless of what we want to be? Like, I just think there are a million beautiful philosophical questions that Game of Thrones kind of throws up into the air. And the fact that they don't catch those balls, I just don't. Because I, we don't have the answers. Like, that's the whole point of fiction, is to give us places to explore questions that we don't understand and parts of ourselves I think that we don't understand and especially the parts of ourselves that scare us the most like the parts of us that we know are capable of you know like what would I do on the back of a dragon when nobody wanted me there but I really did truly believe that I had the only true answer and what makes John so like a kicked puppy through most of the fucking show but it makes me love him so much when Danny says to him, you know what is right. And he says, but I don't. That was beautiful. Like he keeps on acting in what he believes to be right, but he doesn't know. And when he says to Tyrion, was it right? It doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel like it was the right thing to do. And which is why in the end, he just says, fuck all y'all and goes off to the wildlings, because at least then he's responsible for nothing and for no one. And his the, the consequences aren't so high because everyone is free. No one is responsible for anybody else. That is fascinating. Thank you so much. Like I, I am built completely differently, mm. like completely. So it's it's important for me to hear an answer like that so that I can understand because there's so many moments where I talk to people and they're explaining to me why they really got into this one particular scene or this one particular episode. And I'm looking at them like they have three heads because yeah. it doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever why that particular episode would grab them the way that it did. Mm -hmm. um, but this is very helpful. Thank you. I need answers. I'm a person who always needs a conclusion. Sure. I need my my beginning, middle, and end. It and the end just needs to make sense. I don't have to agree with it, but it just has to make sense, and then oh. I'm comfortable with it. But if I have open-ended questions, then I'm like, you're you're driving me crazy. Okay, I'm gonna, <laughs> I want. I would like to split the difference because I know that both of you are Black Sales fans. So I apologize mm -hmm. for a second. I'm going to be very vague to people who have not watched Black Sales, but I know that both of you love Black Sales. And I think that the big difference here is Black Sales is not actually giving you a whole lot of answers in the end. It's not saying, right. I want you to believe this. Right. Yeah. It is actually posing many questions. Like that whole show, that whole story poses questions throughout and really leaves the viewer a lot of open space to to explore and experience and figure out what these questions mean for them but at the same time black sales structurally doesn't leave threads open right. and that's the mm -hmm. difference and i yeah. and and i know that elizabeth loves that about black cells as well so so there sure. i i i love that you're appreciating the questions that are opened by by game of thrones i love those too i think we all do i mean I think that's why we've been watching this show for so long the problem that a lot of us have about the finale or i mean the finale season of game of thrones is that it felt like not like an intentional posing of questions in a way that has a philosophical sense and a philosophical dir like direction, but it felt a little bit like they spent years just throwing stuff at the wall without necessarily paying attention to what they threw at the wall in the past. And that's sure. why for a lot of Which us, think, it's unsatisfying because it doesn't yeah. feel intentional at some point. It starts to yeah. feel haphazard. Right. Could you compare it to the criticism for Lost? I didn't watch Lost. So no, I cannot. Me neither. <laughs> I watched oh. Lost. Okay. Yay. Yeah. Petra. <laughs> Liz, um, did you watch Lost? Yes. Uh-huh. Oh, cool. Okay. Similar. Lost was a lot of like, here's some interesting things to think about. Huh. <laughs> that was the whole, 
<laughs> yeah, I think honestly, I think between Lost, Game of Thrones, and Castle Rock, I am burned I off of. I don't even know what Castle Rock is. What's Castle Rock? Story. It was a, uh, or it is. It's, it's only had one season, but it's a show on Hulu that is a. Oh dear, I guess like an homage to Stephen King. It wasn't written sure. by Stephen King, but it takes place in his universe. Okay, now cool. I remember it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And um, basically, I, I I thought it was going in a very interesting place, and I hated the ending so much I vomited after oh I watched goodness. it. Okay, I've Drew. never I'm so had sorry. that reaction. No before. way. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. not watching that. I'm done with putting my faith in shows actually paying off. As soon as a show starts to go up, but, 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 but just be patient. I tap out mm-hmm. emotionally. Mm-hmm. But anyways, I think the the comparison to lost is warranted in that there was a lot of buildup and uh, not a whole lot of payoff. I, I do think though, that I think somebody else, I want to say Lauren Sarner, I, or possibly Joanna Robinson. I'm not sure. Uh, but a uh, somebody made the point that Lost stumbled by prioritizing character over plot, mm-hmm. and, and Game of Thrones boring. had the opposite mm-hmm. problem. It prioritized plot over character. And for me, mm-hmm. I will forgive an awful lot if you can give me a satisfying character yeah. conclusion. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So I think, yeah, if we're comparing Lost and Game of Thrones, which is a, a warranted comparison, that is the I fundamental think that, I difference. I think that was Lauren's article, yeah. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I can watch the the final scene from Lost on YouTube and cry. Wow. And Game of Thrones finale did not evoke that reaction from me. Sure. Which is kind of, yeah. I mean, which again is kind of amazing. I think, I don't know, Christine, I can't speak for, I don't remember what your reaction was, but like, for me and Petra, like people who had been invested for so many years, the idea that like, I mean, I told everyone in our, in my social world that I just, as of the second to last episode, I just started watching Game of Thrones as a comedy and it worked much better that way. Like when oh it God. started to be a farce of itself. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, to, to be so invested in a story and then to have like literally no emotional response to the ending is kind of amazing i mean it's like you have to work it did you have to work me. hard I also had to make no me not really have, emotional response and, to the ending and you know me i'm a crier like the, the oh, idea yeah. the That's idea a good point. that i could watch that finale with no literally no feelings just like oh okay i think i had a good feeling when i saw john walking off North of the wall with the wildlings, I mean, I was, and I was like, I was, "Cheers to that, buddy!" I'm happy. Hell yeah, I was happy for ghosts. And that was basically all. I think. <laughs> so <laughs> I actually had a flat out sobbing moment, like, and the I had finale? people over. Yes, I had people mm-hmm. over for the for the finale, like sobbing, wet mess, where like you could barely understand the English that's coming out of my mouth. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And it was the scene with Brienne writing Jamie's story yeah. in the Book of Brothers. That's legit. How now, did we just now get there. That was I, beautiful. Wendelin Christie, if you're listening to this, I'm mad as hell at you. She is not because listening to this. <laughs> you made me cry twice this season. Mm-hmm. Like I, I typically don't cry watching Game of Thrones. I cried. I like a tear escaped when Shireen was burned. I. I did sob in a pie shop in Galway when Hodor died. Um, but that's it up until this season. And then Jamie knighting Brienne, like, holy shit. Incredible. Like, yep. that that was an Beautiful. incredible moment that I, you know, I, like, I think I'm getting emotional just talking about it right now, so I'm going to skip right over it. But that moment at the end, for me... Um, and maybe we could talk about Jamie's oh, yeah, arc. We need, right, right. That's what we were supposed to be talking about. That's what we yeah. <laughs> so, to me, to me, that moment was so beautiful because it reminded me of book Jamie, yeah. who oh. I thought is a much richer character than show Jamie. Um, and his arc is 
because it's it, because it's a story, it's a bit more thorough, of course. But he also leaves Cersei a lot sooner than he does in the show. Oh, um, okay. and so mm. his redemption arc in the book, I think, is just like deeper and richer. And on the show, he oscillates back and forth, which is true to life. Yeah. You know, like I'm not mad at that at all. Um, but it, it's just hard to be able to focus on the good things that he did with the quick, messy end that they gave him. I think yes. his arc really suffered from seven episodes last season and six episodes this is particularly the six episodes this then there was so much more we needed between him having sex with Brienne for the first time and then leaving her yeah. in the middle of the night like I got whiplash from that what the fuck was the point besides Brienne losing her v-card before becoming you know lord commander of the king's guard like what again I need it, it's a great question glad mm-hmm. people could think about that but like I need the answer to that question. Yeah, yeah. I have a completely unsatisfied by it. Yes, please. Yes, please. I I was not happy with Jamie's ending in the show. Um, I, I felt it was very haphazard. However, in preservation of my sanity, I have come up with a way of thinking about it that I think works. Please. Oh my god! I love <laughs> I love the preservation. Yeah. Like when when we're all telling like that was we with the brand thing. It's like when we're doing our preservation of sanity theories. <laughs> Exactly. You understand. That is not a good sign. (laughs) So, okay, Jamie. Yeah. Preservation of sanity. (laughs) Yes. Um, Preserve our sanity. This is this this segment dedicated to Lauren Sarner, who's been losing her sanity over Jamie Lannister ever since the finale. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think Jamie's arc wound up being an issue of agency at the end. It's a question of you can become a better person to me, Jamie's story is ultimately about being the person that you choose to be, mm-hmm. that circumstances cannot redeem you. You have to redeem you. Um, so we have three. We have Jamie, Sandor and Theon, uh, who are three characters who are similar. They've been mutilated. They kind of undergo this transformation and and, and sort of move towards a redemption arc. But uh, only Theon actually achieves it. Mm-hmm. Sandor and Jamie both, you know, relapse, if you will, mm-hmm. and they die. Frankly, they they die as their worst selves, and I stand by that for Sandor as well. Yeah, um, no, absolutely. For right. all the progress he made, it all boiled down to I have to get revenge against my brother, which I thought was a. Uh, anyways. <laughs> So with I, I think the show at least acknowledged that one really clearly. They were like, and it was his downfall too. Like he did, but at the visually, same time, I feel like I needed more than just him saying, "Oh, you want to be like me?" Or I, I, I took issue with them giving us this fight scene, this sort of fan servicing fight scene that people have been asking for for seasons. Like, do you want Clegane Bowl? But we're giving you Clegane Bowl. Oh, but isn't it tragic that he's right. you know he could have, giving in to revenge? He could have he could like, have made see, it, this right. is another time that I feel like I'm really happy to just be so outside the fandom. Right. See that's a totally a fandom thing. Things. Right. That is totally yeah, a fandom thing. thing. What was that? The fuck is that, you guys? That was the air horn for Clegane Bolt. Get hi guys. <laughs> Oh, what? good use of sound effects. You can't say Clegane Bowl without. <laughs> See, things I just don't know or right. understand. There's, okay. there's a version of this story. Yeah, Elizabeth Clegane Bowl is the name for it. It was a fandom concept that they chose to put into the show. And, um, Oh, that sucks. Yeah, that's how I felt suck. about it. <laughs> right. It's like, is this just for the Jamie and Brienne shippers? Right. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. There, there are a bunch of things that were fandom things. It would have been, it, like, think about the version of this story where even Sandor got as close as he did, and then he convinced Arya against revenge, and actually made the same choice as himself. Like, because which would it's totally fun. go with Dad Sandor, like that being, that being a parental figure to the Stark girls, 
actually helped him become his better self? Maybe because I'm West Indian. I'm just like, no, he was the dad who was like, do as I say, not as I do. Oh, yeah. He was absolutely (laughs) that dad. He was absolutely that dad. But I'm just saying, you know, thematic. I mean, and they're like, that dad is a thing. Like, I'm that mom. But, um, But from a thematic perspective, I think there was an interesting place they could have gone with having Sandor turn away from Vengeance himself. Okay, but back to Jamie. Go on, yes, Petra. Yes. Tell us. Sorry, redeem, Petra. Totally... Redeem this story for us, please. Oh, well done. <laughs> so I can't quite uh, put an entirely positive spin on this Jamie story, but I do think there's something to be said for, you know, after everything he went through, it boiled down to, are you going to choose to stay in Winterfell with the people who make you better, or are you going to choose to go back to this toxic relationship. Mm. And I know I bring Theon into everything, but I I do think Theon is a a very interesting example of uh, a well-written character arc, but it does... uh, I I don't love how his torture made him a better person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because so much of his toxicity was sort of taken from him when he became Greek. And so he emerged this humbler man, this man who's lost all of this concept of, um, you know, he, he is a supporter of women after he emerges uh, from being Greek, whereas Mm -hmm. before he was so toxically masculine. And so I, I don't like that his abuse made him better, but Jamie likewise went through trauma and mutilation and in the end was given a choice. So, so both, both Theon and Jamie and Sandor reached points where they had a choice. Mm -hmm. Uh, To my mind, Sandor was uh, choosing whether or not to go after his brother. Theon, it was whether or not to endorse Yara at the King's Moot, and Jamie, it was am I going uh, whether or not to go back to Cersei and King's Landing? And at that point, for all three of them, they've they've gone through what they've gone through, but none of that really matters. It's what are you going to do? What do you choose to do? And Theon was the one who decided I'm going to endorse my sister because she will be a better ruler than I would be. That's pure agency and self-actualization. Jamie could have stayed with Brienne, but in the end, he chose to relapse and go back yeah. to the man that he was back in season one. Well, and I would add to that, I'm having this thought on the fly, but I think what what was so intriguing about Theon is the integration like theon was able to take all of these different sides of himself and let everything kind of become because he's been searching for his identity the whole time right he's he's like like it's just this identity search and when he finally i think really heard john when john said you don't have to choose and integrated all of these not only Greyjoy and stark but reek to an extent to the extent that he is someone who will die in service to another person, which is so far from where Theon started. And Jamie, I think, was just not capable of the same kind of integration. Like, he compartmentalized. If he was with Brienne and in Winterfell, then it was having completely left Cersei and left that part of himself and his Lannister self behind. He couldn't integrate those two things. So in the end, it seemed to him to be that impossible choice that Theon had talked about, you know, either Stark or Greyjoy. And he could not choose Winterfell over Lannister. And I think he couldn't choose even his the the side of him that wanted so much to be noble and strong and a true knight over his his self that was a twin that was from the womb a part of Cersei I think especially knowing that death was coming that if it came for Cersei I don't think he could he could envision a version of himself that wasn't tethered to her anymore to me I thought that was obviously tragic and sad but quite beautiful and the only time that I ever cared even a fuck about Cersei I like that interpretation. Yeah, I think 
Tyrion said a lot in a very simple line that he said to Jamie as they were walking about Winterfell and all the northerners are literally spitting on them. And they're they're talking about their sister. And I think it was something along the lines of like how she played them all or something like that. And and Jamie's like, yeah, me most of all. And Tyrion's like, or, or that she fooled them. Right. And, and yes. you know, Jamie, you know, the most of all. And Tyrion's like, the, what are you talking about? Like, yeah. you know who she is and you loved her anyway. Exactly. Um. So, I mean, she was definitely so deeply rooted in who he was and you know, his desires and passion and drive and everything yeah. was for Cersei, you know. He was basically like, I lost my hand for Cersei. It wasn't yeah. about yeah. Brienne. It was about getting back to Cersei by any means possible, yeah. right? Um, so that that addiction and need for her has always been there. I yeah. just, as a viewer, seeing how toxic she was and how, yeah, Jamie is a fuck boy. But he's got like, he's had good intentions from since before this story started, you know, right. like, yeah. he's got this rap, this and this is why the you know, the end scene for me was so powerful. He's got this terrible, you know, international reputation for saving the people of King's Landing, mm. which he doesn't get you know, credit for, right? Which he doesn't get credit right. for until after he dies and Brienne writes it in the Book of Brothers, it's you know? so moving. Right, but yeah. she doesn't actually write it about the the actual heroic thing he did, but she ends up giving kind of in a backhanded way, she, she ends up giving him credit for being the honorable man that he was, you know, basically a generation ago. Well, but not just a generation ago, but she talked, she wrote about his deeds at River Run. Yes. She wrote about the fact that, you know, that, that he was able to do that without, you know, loss of life, that he yeah. decided to fight with the army of the living against the army of the dead. And he fought bravely and survived, you know, and he came back to King's Landing and died in service of his queen. Like, yeah, and there was a lot more, yeah. right? There was a lot more that she wrote about him. Um, about the good deeds that he mm -hmm. um, had made. And for me, they were just so powerful and so real, Jamie, not yeah. fuckboy Jamie, but like the real Jamie that we don't get to see that often that he, yeah. that, the, that even the, Cersei didn't see. That Cersei didn't see and the Jamie mm -hmm. that he always wanted to be as he was growing up looking at knights like Sir Barristan Selmy and being like, mm -hmm. I want to grow up to be like that. And he had moments like that. And Bronn comes into Wintertown and basically tells him with a crossbow to his face, your sister wants you dead yet again. That's what I'm here for. And like two days later, he's on the road to King's Landing to her. That was the part where I was just like, I, this no longer makes sense right. to me. It didn't make that sense. I, I can yeah. understand an addiction, but to me, I, I was just like, I, this crossbow in my face would make me very sober. Okay. So let me, <laughs> let me bring up the thing sure. that didn't end it. Like the, I see what Brienne, wrote about him is really I mean I love it in a lot of ways because it gave him credit for things in the timeline that we saw but ultimately the most honorable thing Jamie did was to be a kingslayer like the most honorable thing he ever did in his whole life the most heroic moment of his life was not I I disagree that he just wanted to be like the great heroes he was a great hero yeah he was in mm -hmm. fact a great hero and that the version of Jamie that we see at the beginning of this story is the version that has bought into the mythology that he is actually without honor. Right. And so that's the part that's interesting to me. Like the whole, the meat of his story is that in the exact moment that he did the most honorable thing he ever could have done is the moment this is where this is where the idea of the power of story actually is significant in this story not in the way that Tyrion used it in the very last episode but the idea that 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 a man could do his most honorable act of his whole life 
and have that act be reframed as the least honorable act a person could do to be a Kingslayer Mm -hmm. and to have his whole life be basically his conflict with that not making any sense like that he did Mm -hmm. the most honorable thing he could possibly do the world frames him as the least honorable person possible therefore what does it matter at that point like i feel like the jamie that we meet at the beginning of this is just like fuck it all no one's going to ever see me as honorable i kind of believe them at this point like they've all told me i'm a horrible Mm. person for being a kingslayer therefore you know, I might as well, I might as well just like be this guy. And then we watch him inch his way back through Brienne's eyes in a, in many ways. Like Brienne's the person that he finally tells that story to of saying, mm-hmm. you know what? I really did all of this to save everyone and that she believes him and that he starts to see himself through her eyes. And that's how he starts to come back. And I think the fact that it's Brienne is incredibly powerful because the person who kicked off this whole thing of telling the story of the Kingslayer was the most honorable man in Westeros, Ned Stark. Mm-hmm. Ned Stark walked That's into true. that room. Oh my God, you're right. Ned is totally Jamie. involved in that, right? Well, no, no. Wait, wait, wait. Is, is that in the books? No, that's in the, that. in the show as well. That's in the show as well. They talk too? about the moment. It's in the show. It's season one. So okay. yeah. Jamie, Jamie kills Ares, and I think he's like contemplating right. the gravity of what he's done. And, Ned and he sits down it. on the Iron Throne, and in walks Ned Stark to find dead Ares and Jamie Lannister on the throne, mm-hmm. and he judges him immediately. Yep. This is the basis uh, of their the beginning hatred. of the Kingslayer story. Yep. It's yeah. so true. Now you fast forward to Brienne and Jamie in the pool. Mm-hmm. And Brienne is one of the closest people you will find to Ned Stark in the story by that time. I like her much she better, but yes. Truest, <laughs> she is the truest knight. Yeah. She's the truest knight. Mm-hmm. She, is the, she is the epitome of what a knight should be, of what honor should be. And I think in sharing his story with her, it's almost like telling Ned Stark what actually happened in his heart and in his mind a little bit. You know, that mm-hmm. this is the most honorable person I've come across. And I'm just going to I'm just going to share this story because I never got my opportunity with Ned to share it. Hmm. Yeah. No, that's absolutely true. <sighs> Yeah, I, I I think I can't come to terms with the season eight thing. If for no other reason, it's not even necessarily like I I wish that he, as much as it was beautiful and very satisfying, the moment when Jamie and Brienne have sex with each other, uh, uh-huh. I wish it didn't happen because they chose to undo it so quickly. Yeah, but ultimately, my biggest problem with. Jamie's story is one line that they didn't need to put in there is what he says yes! to Tyrion that he doesn't care about the people of King's Landing like, and I, I've fuck? like what tried to contort my mind into like all of the reasons why like Jamie would have said that because he's trying to convince himself but none of it works like the yeah. idea that that one line mm-hmm. kind of undo- undoes the essence of what made Jamie so interesting all along was exactly the thing I said before, this conflict between the honorable act being redefined as the least honorable act for him to just like randomly say, again, it was not necessary. He did not need to say that to Tyrion right then. I don't know why they put that line. I really don't know why they put that line in. But Maybe um, it's the ultimate acceptance of the fuckboy narrative that he's been hearing. I was going to say, that's what I... The only version of that line that works... Like Jamie... That that it, it to, to me that showed us that he was going to revert back and that he just couldn't sure get outside I, of that. I don't know that he had just decided to be what everyone said that he was. It feels to me like one of those moments. And again, you can you can fill in the gaps of almost anything in season eight and make it make sense mm-hmm. if you choose to. Like there, you know what I mean. But it felt to me like that line felt like the writers forgetting what was interesting about Jamie all along. And, and like mm, there was a way to sure. make that line work as exactly the thing you two just filled in about it. Like 
I definitely tried to fill in that about it to make it work for me because I really like desperately wanted Jamie's story to feel narratively satisfying. Like I don't need characters to like end in a way that I want them to. I don't need happy endings. I don't need anything. I need to feel like someone that I was emotionally invested in goes down a road that makes sense at the very least. And that sure. line didn't make sense. And there was a way I'm sure to make that line make sense, but I don't feel like they did it. Like three more episodes. Sure. Or something, <laughs> or even a few more lines, honestly, in that scene, sure. there was like, or, or honestly just leaving that line out because I feel like the idea that, that he has taken his descent back towards Cersei out of shame. We already got mm -hmm. that. We didn't need the line that kind of negated everything that was his struggle for seven seasons before that. Yeah, this was the epitome of that meme that came out. Yeah, where, I forgot. <laughs> um, I can't remember if it was or Dan the, or Danny, Danny, but it, it was started like, with yeah, it was started with Danny. Danny, Danny, Danny yeah, forgot Danny about the forgot that, right. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and now it's turned into well, so and so forgot this, and so and so forgot that, and it's like the writers forgot that JB saved everybody in King's Landing. <laughs> like mm. that was that is a major part of his entire story. Did you not feel that that was helped at all when he says to Cersei as the walls crumble, no one else matters, just you and me? Nope. Nope. Because nope. I feel like that's that's a line that's been said more than once, yep. right? Like Cersei said it to, to him. Yep. Right. You know, we're the only we're the only Lannisters that count or whatever. We're the only ones left. It just no. You just we just didn't mm. need a line about him not caring about the people of King's Landing. It was just that was just that's like for me that's the ultimate I, I moment of of sloppy storytelling. It felt so stubborn. It felt so willful and so obviously untrue that to me it felt like part of the character work. I totally see the way that you saw it and I think that God only knows and it doesn't really matter. But except that every single other thing, like I love the conversation between Jamie and Tyrion, their last conversation. I love that mm -hmm. scene. Yeah. Every other thing that the two of them said to each other was true. That's yep. the problem is that every moment in that conversation was like two men who loved each other deeply and had been honest to each other throughout their stories mm -hmm. like that that we knew throughout this whole story that those two people were so flawed and loved each other despite all of their flaws and that they didn't like you, you had again you had right before that or I mean, a few episodes before that the moment where where jamie tried to say something that was bullshit and Tyrion's like oh come on they right. know yeah, I guess each I, other. I, guess I saw it as the no. same thing, just not called out. No, because yeah. there is no such thing as them not calling each other out. There was right. never that. Is, that was never part of their relationship okay. with each other. Okay. I mean, even though Tyrion was trying to convince Jamie of something, I just don't buy it as one of the tactics he was used mm -hmm. to be disingenuous with his brother. Because that's the one thing that those two had for each other in a world of lies and backstabbing and horribleness and their horrible father and the horrible things honestly that they in a way did to each other kind of you know through their family horrible structure the one thing that these two people had to each other was that level of honesty with each other except i don't know if jamie ever told Tyrion what about why he killed Ares. no he, he might not have but he did he no 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 um, there's a scene where Tyrion tells Daenerys that Jamie told him about Ares's plan to burn King's Landing. Oh, which is oh. It, it begs the question: When did he tell Tyrion that, and and all of that? But it's necessary so that Tyrion can talk Daenerys out of burning cities. Ah, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. okay. Hmm. Uh, Not the best moment uh, in continuity on the show, but uh, sure. that did happen <laughs> in season seven. Not the best. Should we start? Like, we need to have come up with an award for not the movie. best moment in continuity. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Hashtag fire that guy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
Uh, yes. I mean, I guess ultimately that gets to my whole thing that I've been keep saying is that like they were amazing producers. They produced an amazing show and maybe they should have had more writers. Um, Who were women oh, and yeah. maybe that would have been color. That would have been awesome. There you go. Um, okay. Oh, a good thing. Well, I think that even though we have many more topics, it might be time for us to wrap things up. That sounds right. Is there anything anyone else would like to bring up before we go to favorite things? I would like to say, um, can I just say, <laughs> um, that one of the reasons why I was super excited to do this podcast with you guys today was because Petra was on it. And um, I think it is an absolute honor for anyone to be able to listen to Petra talk about Theon Greyjoy. <laughs> and the fact that I got to hear it live before any of you who are listening right now or actually mm -hmm. listening to it is a fucking honor. Like I am <laughs> super stoked and, um, Petra, I am a fan of the fandom and I am a huge fan of yours. So I am super excited to be on this podcast with one of my favorite people in the world, Miss Daphne Olive, and to meet you, Liz, finally after hearing about you Thank for so you. long. But Petra, honestly, huge, huge honor to hear you talk about the online. I agree. Thank you so much, Christine. I agree. Yes, Petra, you're one of my favorite people to read things that you say about the show generally but also particularly about theon thank mm -hmm. you um okay so shall we move on to favorite things who would like to go first i actually i actually thought of mine ahead of time which is something i Look at rarely you. remember to do <laughs> it's true you almost never remember <laughs> elizabeth you want to go first yeah. sure sure um so i want to talk about the long night and why it worked for me so much because it's not really necessarily um well because it's personal i suppose mm -hmm. I loved that episode, even though I completely understand your argument, Daphne, that you felt that it was boring. <laughs> I completely get that. I completely get that. That was my most emotional episode of all of Game of Thrones and became my, became my favorite because I feel like, for whatever reason, the production of that episode really captured those really long battles and how a long battle is not one fight. It's like a thousand tiny little fights where anything can go right or wrong and everything tips the scales and everything counts, but also nothing feels significant and it just keeps going. Um, I loved I, I thought it was beautiful also. I thought that there were so many moments where we had, I think of John and Danny up in on the dragons in the sky. They've got all these people below them they are responsible for, that they have, uh, they, they're like gods. They're regal up above them, but can't actually see them, like can't actually enact any kind of change or have any kind of they have this ultimate power but they can't actually see what's happening on the ground i thought that was really beautiful melisande obviously t uh, with the whole um fire on the trench we've already talked about was is so beautiful theon of course there was so much happened in that episode i think that just really captured this idea of the march of death being slow but insidious and steady and inevitable and that whole idea of a long night and it hit me emotionally beautifully it also reminded me a lot of um not so much the march of death but like for me getting out of poverty is that same kind of like it's just always there and one wrong move and you're dead and that's it and you're never getting out again <laughs> and it was moving and beautiful and elegant in a way that i have not come to expect uh, to expect game of thrones to be hmm. subtle in a way that i do not expect game of thrones to be and i thought it was beautiful and held the soundtrack in that episode which was just quiet 
and silent and piano even playing soft. There were no like, I'm so tired of the whole Hans Zimmer, like the slowed down brass. Like I can't even like the honking almost the like it's dramatic. And it's just with the whole opposite way of just being quiet and still and frightening. I thought it was beautiful. So I feel like that's an excellent segue into my favorite thing from mm. this season. And it's actually the person who I think is the MVP for the season. And that is Mr. Jawadi. Um, I think that the music this season was the best mm. out of all eight. I think that the music definitely added to the suspense um, and the horror of the long night episode. I thought that, you know, the music soared during moments of hope and like plunged in moments of despair. And it took you on a ride, even when the storytelling was not as, at its best. The music always delivered. Mm -hmm. um, and I find that it was actually powerful just by itself. So, um, again, we talked about emotional moments and how, you know, there really wasn't that much crying this season. Um, and I actually, I'm surprised, I was surprised that I didn't cry during the Stark montage at the end, which I thought was beautifully stitched together, right? Um, but I, I didn't cry. And I found myself a couple of days later on the Metro coming home. And I just decided to put on the music for that season. And I got to the music that played at that moment, the last of the Starks. And it, mm -hmm. I started crying in public on the train, <laughs> just listening to it. It is just such a, a moving song that gets you in your gut. And I mean, the Stark theme has always done that for me, mm -hmm. but this particular version of it that brings in the music that he has used for, each of those characters was overwhelming and he just, he really helped bring a lot of positivity to this season for me in a way that was much needed in order for me to feel good at the end of this show. So much thanks to him. Wow. All right, Petra, you're up. Um, I, well, I'd also like to second, uh, Jawadi's score was extraordinary. Uh, I'd say I want to give a shout out to Yara and Brienne's arcs because mm -hmm. it was really nice to have these two female characters self-actualize and achieve their goals quite straightforwardly, all things considered. Um, Yara Greyjoy wanted to rule the iron islands and she concludes the show ruling the iron islands brienne wanted to avenge renly she wanted to protect the weak and the innocent and become a knight and she did all three of those things mm. and in a show as fraught with uh, se sexism as it is mm -hmm. that was just so lovely also because i was fully prepared for both of them to die <laughs> right. that they both survived the show in wonderful positions of self-enfranchisement was was lovely mm -hmm. that's true all right i'm gonna go much smaller than any of you with my <laughs> favorite thing um, my favorite thing is a surprise to me as well, because I am actually not a person who is fixated on this character. Um, but my favorite thing are the looks of reassurance that Padraig Payne gave to Brienne right before her knighting. Um, mm. and I've not been like, I'd be like, always like, kind of like, oh, Podrick's cute. I liked the whole thing of like, Podrick's this like sex god. I, you know, all that stuff was amusing, Podrick's but I amazing. never really cared that much about Podrick particularly um, but when I saw those moments of Brienne looking to him for reassurance and that for me is one of those things like I loved it in the moment but I also love it in the aggregate because 
it's when you saw the power of those looks that they exchanged with each other that you realize how subtly, even though this sort of story is often so bombastic and so bad at character, um, the building of the relationship between Brienne and Podrick is something that they did slowly, subtly, and steadily. And mm-hmm. those moments between them in that episode are so powerful because of the exactly the kind of storytelling that is so important to me. Um, that we, you know, you could have easily, and I probably was that person who like, was like, oh, yeah, that's cute, these scenes between them. But I never really thought about it that much. But the payoff in this moment was so strong. It was... Yeah. I know everyone focuses on Jamie and Brienne's reactions to each other and their faces during Mm -hmm. the nighting. But for me, the moments that were the most meaningful in that scene was exactly that, was that Brienne looking to Podrick, who was her inferior and who she, you could easily have thought she had not really given a shit about that much all these seasons. And yet you see, you get it. Like you so get it. You yeah. understand the bond that these two people had built with each other. And it is his reassurance that make, gives her the strength to do yeah. it. It's not Jamie. It's Podrick that gave her that. And that's so beautiful. That's lovely. Yeah. I'm so glad you brought that it's up. It's my, it's like, yep, it's, it's so good. By far it's my favorite callback. moment in the whole season. There is no question. Yeah. Oh, it's a lovely callback, <laughs> too, really to when Sansa is is trying to give the pledge that yep. the Lady of the House gives and she doesn't know what it is and Podrick is filling it's it in just, and he's so yeah. proud. It's just uh, everything. Impeccable casting, right. too. Right. Podrick is. He's amazing. He's just, amazing. Yes. He's amazing. No question. Yes. Mm-hmm. And it's just, yeah, it's just one of those moments where you didn't even know you wanted it. It's like if I had listed all the things I wanted from this season that would not have even remotely have occurred to me. And yet that was the moment that really tied so many things about all of the seasons together for me, both about these two characters and kind of in the larger thematic sense. It just really, it was really beautiful. So that's my favorite thing. (laughs) I love it so much. Like I could literally watch those two give each other those looks over and over again and I would be happy. You know, people, people uh, have asked me often, you know, where I come down on, on Brienne and Jamie or Brienne and Torment. And I'm like, fuck both of those guys. Like Jamie doesn't deserve her. Torment doesn't deserve her. I want her to be with someone like Pod. Not Pod. <laughs> not Pod exactly. I want that's, Pod to just be right. the person Someone he is for her. Like right. Pod. Yeah. yeah. I totally agree with like you. Like him. Right. Who respects the shit out of her, who yeah. idolizes her, who puts her up on a pedestal and thinks the absolute world of her mm. and knows her inside right. and out. I mean, you don't travel with someone for that long and not know. And for me, like it's interesting that all the that, dirty that, shit about that, that person and still love them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. For me, I, I saw that scene just slightly differently in that Brienne looked at him like, can you believe this shit? Like, really? <laughs> oh, I'm so, sure that's, yeah. And, he goes, and his face is like, dude, you want this. Right. I know oh, you. I love it so much. That's it's so it. Good. And take it. You've earned this. Yeah, like, it's I so saw good. all of that in his face. Dan Portman just nailed that scene with the <laughs> Yes. And I'm pretty sure that's when my tears started. Yeah. When sure. I was just like, oh my God, is this happening? Is this happening? And then with that look, that was when I just, no, it was, the waterwork it was, happened. It was so brilliant. No, and you're right, because I think people who want Jamie and Brienne together in a lot of ways want that for Jamie. It's like Jamie, right. like, you know what I mean? So weird. Like that exactly. ship, that ship has a lot to do with, with Jamie. about Jamie fulfilling his emotional arc. Um, And also Brienne, but it's true. It's like Brienne, I understand like the like, you know, the girl who wasn't the cheerleader who gets the cute guy. Like she is definitely like she is every 80s story. She she is pretty and she is the pretty and pig story. Right. Okay. Okay. So there is an element of that that I feel like is satisfying. But ultimately, you're right. It's like Brienne deserves better than Jamie. She deserves better than the guy who like took forever to realize he was in love with her. Mm hmm. Um. Yeah, I mean, true. she said in the in the middle of the like, the, as they were prepping, like, what's going on with this conversation? You haven't insulted me exactly. yet. Exactly. Like, 
that that is not the sign of a healthy relationship. <laughs> no, that's true. That's very true. All right, ladies, I think we better re- wrap this up all together. So if uh, you all could, uh, well, if our two guests could tell us where people can find you on the internet, and I will put those links in the show notes. Let's start with Petra. You can find me on Twitter at PL Halber, and you can find me on Watchers on the Wall. And this is Christine. You can find me um, occasionally on Your Watch Begins podcast, which is a Game of Thrones podcast. And you could also find me on Twitter at Kippins K. All right. And I will put links to all of those things. I'm also, because I'm very self-indulgent, going to put a link to Petra's amazing video that includes John Silver's arc. Thank you. (laughs) I want to see that. Because I love (laughs) it. Um, Thank you so much for joining us. This has been really fun. You all, I was worried. Elizabeth knows this. Actually, Christine, actually all three of you, I think got to hear me worry about doing this episode. It was a lot of fun. I had a great time. Thanks so much for having me on. I always have a great time on this podcast. Mm, Thank you. Well, cheers, ladies. See you guys at Con of Thrones. I know. Yes. I know. Yes, it's going to be so exciting. Con of Thrones is going to be a whole lot of fun. Until next time from Common Room Radio, I'm Elizabeth Stevens. And I'm Daphne Olive. Can I just say podcast is a Common Room Radio production. For more information and our other shows, visit commonroomradio.com. To show your support, pledges of as little as $1 a month can make a big difference. Visit patreon.com slash commonroomradio to pledge support and access bonus features that are just for patrons. And join the conversation by using the hashtag Can I Just Say and follow us on Twitter at Just Say Podcast. We request that you keep your tweets respectful and positive, and you can always email us at podcast at commonroomradio.com. Thanks for listening. <laughs>